Uh, so we're going to have, I guess, three sessions. One is going to be on the climate-informed decision-making under uncertainty, user needs, challenges, and opportunities. Two of our speakers are will be remote. One of them, Jennifer Jacobs, is right here in this very room. Um, the session two after the break will be uncertainty and climate modeling, state-of-the-art, low-hanging fruits, and future directions. And then the grand finale will be a panel discussion from four to five. And I think that's going to be a great discussion, actually. So there we are. How to participate. Okay. You're going to do my slides, right? Yes, we're going to project your slides. Okay. Um, so for the public who is watching, thank you for joining. Uh, um, if anyone has any questions, you may ask them on the Slido where you can join by just going to slido.com and you can enter this meeting code here, 3833206. Uh, we will be moderating those questions um, and we have a representative here who will ask them for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to provide the introduction to this, um, an overview for about 15 minutes, maybe 13 minutes. Um, and so could I have my first slide? There we are, Introduction, Uncertainty and Climate Modeling for Decision-Making. And this is by myself, but also we have this, uh, what I would like to call an uncertainty collective uh, <laughs> with Barnes, Fufula, Giorgio, Liang, McGovern, and myself again. So there we are. So first of all, starting with some of the basics, um, what is uncertainty? Of course, there are many different definitions uh, I'm going to use one that is rarely prosaic for the climate community. That is that it's a state of lack of knowledge um, or incomplete knowledge regarding the past, present, or future. It usually has two components um, of random, the aleatory uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty resulting for our incomplete knowledge due to the complexity of the world. Uh, there are other com um, ideas associated with this, such as deep uncertainty, which is, as the name implies, characterized by a lack of agreement, parties to a decision cannot agree upon, the external context of the system, how the system works and its boundaries, and or the outcomes of interest from the system. And I think deep uncertainty is quite rife in the issue of climate change. And then there's the great concept of wicked problems. I would say that NCAR, that um, climate change is a typical wicked problem, defies rational and optimal solutions, characterized by deep uncertainties and with many interdependencies and causes that interact and posited solutions can lead to new unintended consequences and are difficult to test. And I think that's definitely the world we are in with climate change. Next, please. So we're starting with why start with decisions rather than the climate? Um, many of us have who have worked in this area of not just climate change, but connecting it to um, the impacts and the people who will be making decisions. If you begin with the user's needs, um, you create a collaborative problem definition, including all parties involved. You can support interactions and learning. And the rationale really is to identify what knowledge is really needed by decision makers and what is feasible for science to deliver. And that's a direct quote from the Natu National Research, Research Council 2007 report informing decisions in a changing climate. So what decisions? primarily adaptation and mitigation at what spatial scales, all spatial scales from the global to the local. What temporal scales, we're going, specifically going to be dealing with multi-decadal scales in our discussions today, um, but the information needed for adapt adaptation in particular are on multiple scales down to the sub-daily, for example, hourly. Next. So here's what I would call the, um, the typical cascade of uncertainty 
This is the standard traditional one where you start with you know, emissions, you clunk the emissions through the climate and regional modeling. You use that to come up with impacts model with impacts using impacts models. And then you finally get down to decisions in the lower um, left-hand corner, my left hand. Next. But really, you know, a while ago it's been realized that really the decision making should be the central focus. Um, and so here we do have the decision making here. It's not that these other parts are not important. It's just that starting with the decisions actually get you further, faster, in point of fact. Next. Another major uh, context, and this has been mentioned in earlier discussions today, is the whole concept of risk assessment. And this, a lot of my slides are from the IPCC. Um, I think, it's pretty well understood that adopting a risk assessment approach is also one of the best ways to get at um, how to build a resilient society um, that can handle various climate changes. So this is just the uh, what's called the propeller diagram from working group two, the AR5. And um, one of the things I really like about this diagram is the fact that it balances the socioeconomic processes with the climate. So climate is once again, no longer the top dog, if you will. It's kind of like the meowing cat somewhere in the middle. Sorry, I just couldn't resist that. I should have, but I couldn't. Um, and so risk in this context is seen as a um, composed of the hazards, vulnerability and exposure to the hazards. Next. So risk management, iterative risk management is a useful framework for decision-making in complex situations characterized by large potential consequences, persistent uncertainties, long timeframes, and multiple climatic and non-climatic influences changing over time. And this is again from, this, in this case, the 2014 report of the working group two. Next, what climate models are considering? You know, I would get to the climate models eventually. Um, so we're really talking about Earth system models. Um, and of course, we heard a lot about that this morning from our various guests. Um, and though it's important for use of information from ESMs for decision making, uh, we're not really going to discuss in detail the various downscaling techniques used to bring ESM results to decision relevant scales, but I imagine some of our speakers will refer to that. Next. All right, so here's a, a sample of just the relationship between climate modeling and applications, uses for decision-making. This is from a, a proto program at NCAR. And here they're putting the earth system prediction in the center, but notice that We're kind of skipping from this earth system prediction, kind of skipping the data processing, visualization and analytics, convergent research. And we're just kind of going from the earth system out to applications and stakeholders. And obviously, while we're not going to be discussing this in any detail, it's come up sometime um, this morning. So there's a lot going on and I'm not suggesting that that diagram is uh, in any way complete. Next slide. Related but different relevant concepts. So certainly we know that climate models, science in general, are aiming for increasing scientific understanding. And we know pretty much how to do that. And we generate a lot of understanding. Um, the idea of reducing uncertainty is, was bruited about earlier when we were putting together this, this agenda. And um, I personally, I'm always worried about the concept of reducing uncertainty because of what specifically and what will we really gain from it. Um, another thing is the increasing, increasing the credibility of future simulations through detailed uh, analysis of the climate model results. So we can say, yes, we believe this model result, but not so much that one. Pray continue. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so here's just a sample of a diagram that many of you have probably seen, improvements in GCMs, deepening understanding. We know going back from the um, um, climate models from the mid 1970s, um, and this goes through AR5, and there's this continuous increase in the complexity of the models. They are constantly um, incorporating important processes. Let's say, for example, the carbon cycle is a very big one. Atmospheric chemistry, land ice going into AR4, AR5. And certainly that is generating more understanding of the system. Um, but is it generating better usable data? I think sometimes that remains to be seen. Next. So here's just further development since AR5. I, I'm just have made a list of this, of course, model grids and resolutions continue to increase um, the representation of physical and chemical processes. Representation of the biogeochemistry, including carbon cycle and re representation of the terrestrial nitrogen cycle coupled to land carbon cycle, which does result in a reduction of uncertainty for carbon budgets. And then further work uh, on model tuning and adjustment. Next slide. All right, so here's a sample of the, the model resolution issue comparing CMIP5 to CMIP6. Um, all the scales are identical on the two slides. And you can simply see that obviously CMIP6, uh, there are many more models. There's also a high res MIP. Um, and everything has moved to your right. And there are many more models at high resolution. The, the high-res MIP models are down to somewhere between 25 and 50 kilometers uh, horizontal resolution um, and an oceanic resolution a little bit higher than that. So there's been you know, very dramatic increases from CMIP 5 to CMIP 6. Next slide. OK, then uncertainties relevant to global climate models. Uh, I'm just going to give you sort of a, a sample here of something that was said in the AR6. Overall, we assess that increases in computing power and the broader availability of larger and more varied ensembles of model simulations have contributed to better estimations of uncertainty in projections of future change. It's better estimations of the uncertainty, not necessarily a reduction in the uncertainty. And I think that's a very important distinction that is sometimes not well appreciated. Next slide. Um, here's another, here's one of the, you know, the parameters that have been looked at throughout the history of the uh, IPCC, which is the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And two things I want to point out. Um, so through each of the different IPCC reports, there have been changes, not all of them have, for example, included a central tendency. Um, AR5, it created the likely range with a P greater than 66%, going from um, 1 to 6. And then in AR6, they came up with a very likely and likely range and a best, e and a best estimate. <laughs> All right, so these things have bounced around every time the IPCC comes out. It's like, oh my God, what happened? The numbers have changed. Are we going to go to hell in a handbasket faster than we thought? Um, but there's something else going on here, and that is the evolution of the methods for determining this. And so, for example, in AR6, the models themselves, those 50 climate models, were not actually used explicitly to determine the climate sensitivity. Rather, um, a combined evidence from process understanding, instrumental record, paleoclimates, and emergent constraints. And that's how they came up with uh, this range, the very likely from 2 to 5 percent, two, two, uh, sorry, 2 to 5 degrees C. So I think that's interesting. Of course, methods evolve too, but it's interesting because this is, you know, the, the iconic example of a major climate change parameter. Two fingers means peace. 
two minutes? Okay. <laughs> uh, go on, I think I'm near the end here. Yes, okay, importance of extremes and compound extremes regarding decision-making. So I point out as Mary did earlier, <coughs> the PCATS report about extreme weather risk in a changing climate. Um, and there are, you should look at that report. Um, it's really great to see this. Um, and hopefully this will mean that more focused attention to extremes in different agencies will follow. I'm gonna point out a couple of things. Of course, we know the single variable extremes, high temperatures, uh, increased high precipitation. But we also have two other things, under the low likelihood high impact LLHI events, such as the shutdown at the Atlantic Thermal Highland Circulation. So there's very little confidence in the likelihood of any of those things, but they would have incredible impacts. And so the point is, um, sure, there's lack of confidence, reflects a lack of knowledge, but we know that the impacts would be horrendous. And so it might be interesting, behoove us to think about how can we reflect on those LLHI events in um, new and creative ways. But then another emphasis these days has been high app impacts all results from compound extremes to a more events occurring simultaneously or in rapid succession. Um, a good example, and I'm sure one of our speakers will refer to flood occurrence in coastal regions, which is a function of storm surge, extreme rainfall, river flow, and sea level rise, all of those things happening at the same time. There's also very high confidence that hot and dry conditions will be paired and become more probable in nearly all land regions in the future. Next. And finally, one of my concerns is what is the danger of false certainty for decision-making? And I don't really know if decision-makers um, think about that. I'm sure they think about it. I don't know if they try to study it. And then finally, yes, the New Yorker cartoon from 2007. Um, I show this, well, because I'm from New York, but also at one point I calculated how high the sea level rise would have to be in order for those many floors of the Empire State Building to still be visible. And cutting to the chase, I have almost a whole seminar on this one slide. I won't do that now. Um, cutting to the chase, this scenario is literally incredible. There's no way you could get this much of the Empire State Building covered, even if all of Antarctica and the Arctic melted. So, oh, to say nothing of the fact that it stops at the edge of Pennsylvania, which is very <laughs> unusual, but there we are. So I, I've been meaning to find the time to write the New Yorker and suggest that they are um, spreading false information. <laughs> Haven't quite done that yet. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. I think I'm done, thanks. And I don't think I have to face any questions, do I? Because this is just the introduction, right? Okay. Hi, this is Efi Fufula Georgiou. I will moderate session one. Join audio? No. no. Don't join. Okay. Don't join. Yeah. Uh, so, so Linda presented a very nice overview, took us from the definition of uncertainty to the improvement in the resolution from CIMIP 5 to CIMIP 6 to risk assessment and management that involves all the hazards, exposure, vulnerability. Uh, pointed out the important thing that uh, do we really reduce uncertainty or we do get better estimates of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, finally, the dangers of um, counting too much on the uncertainty quantification from the models. I would like for the sessions to take a different kind of uh, starting point. The morning we had here discussion by uh, leaders at NSF, NOAA, NASA, and DOE. And we ended up with a very lovely discussion on uh, the um, climate ready nation, which we, was defined as providing the best data that meet 
the users the user needs mm -hmm. so i would like to say that basically the sessions that we have this afternoon session one will focus on what are the user needs i mean there are many sectors that will use the climate data and climate information. These are projections and predictions and even raw observational data. Uh, and these user needs, uh, you know, they're from many sectors. Uh, it could be the economy, human well-being. Uh, it could be, um, you know, grid failure. It could be agricultural, uh, food security, even national security. Uh, so what time horizons do they need? Uh, what kind of time span, time space scales, what confidence bounds can, can they live with? Uh, at the same time, um, the sec and uh, the questions are here. How do we quantify uncertainty and how do we communicate uncertainty so we can uh, be on a better path to adapt these products for decision making. But this will be session one, which is what are the user needs? Session two will be what is the state of the art of the models? What can they provide now? What uncertainty do they have? What sources of uncertainty are there? Which ones can be reduced? Which are ones are irreducible and so forth? And then session three will be the panel that will bring the two together both directions from user needs to the climate models and the climate models to the users. So with that, I would like to start with session one and introduce our first speaker, Robert Lambert. Uh, Robert is the director of the Frederick Pardee Center for Longer Range Global Policy and the Future Human Condition. Uh, he is also a principal researcher at the RAND uh, Corporation. His research focuses on risk management and decision making under conditions of deep uncertainty. He has many accolades. I will not spend the time to present here, but he has been involved in the IPCC six ass assessment report and also a chair of the review panel of the California Fourth Climate Assessment. Uh, he got his bachelor in physics and political science from Stanford University and PhD in applied physics and uh, uh, science policy from Harvard. So Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me get my slides up. Um, great. Um, can everybody see the slides okay? Yes, great. looks good. Okay, good. Um, so uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to start with a little bit of the uh, the same uh, definitional stuff that, that Linda did and then dive into some, to some examples and really organize my comments on climate information around this concept of deep uncertainty and then um, uh, climate stress tests as a way of thinking about user need. So um, as, uh, as, as climate change can usefully be understood as a risk management challenge, Linda touched on this. Um, here are the, the definitions of risk and risk management that uh, uh, were used in um, AR6. Um, and just want to emphasize a couple of things here. One is the, uh, the the notion that responding to climate change is an iterative learning process where we scope the problem, do the analysis, implement, learn, and, and repeat. Um, Linda mentioned the idea of wicked problems um, and this idea of, of multiple framings and reframings of the problem is, is one of the key ways of addressing uh, wicked problems. And, and this idea on the right, um, which is very much emphasized in, in, in AR6, is that while we've got our, our formal um, axiomatic and mathematical definition of risk of probability times consequence, um, it's, it's often useful to see it as a much broader concept of the effect of uncertainty on objectives, which allows for a whole range of both quantitative and, and qualitative uh, judgments. Um, and then the, the other sort of key framework is, is thinking of climate information as part of a process of decision support. Um, this again is from this uh, uh, report, uh, NRC report informing decisions in a changing climate, which, which Linda touched on. Um, decision support represents organized efforts to produce, disseminate, and facilitate the use of data information to improve decisions, to reach better decisions. And among the key elements is to really pay lots of attention to decision processes, you know, how people are making decisions, um, 
when what types of information comes into the process uh, can be at least as important. Who participates in the decision making is can be at least as important as the decision products themselves. This idea of co-producing the knowledge among uh, information users and producers, and then a variety of other factors, institutional stability, which gets into the um, notion of, say, boundary organizations, which help um, connect the scientists and the, the users and this idea of uh, design for learning. So um, I, I raise these because these are all really central points to keep in mind as we think about what information is important because it really lies in this larger context. Okay, Lynn, this is a simpler version of the, the, the diagram that Lynn, Linda showed, but we often think about climate information sitting in, in the chain where we start with emissions and other drivers, look at the climate effects, look at their effect on natural and human systems, and that allows us to think about impacts and risks. And then we can think in the adaptation space, at least about intervening in those systems to, to reduce risks, to reduce the impacts. And um, very often we think about the climate information in, in informing vulnerability assessments and then, then the, the actions in this predict and act framework where we try to characterize future uh, conditions, use that to rank near-term decisions and then maybe do some desensitivity analysis. And the, the, the notion that what we want to do is reduce uncertainty uh, fits in this predict and act framework um, because it allows us to make uh, better, uh, more higher confidence re uh, rankings of alternative decisions. Um, this, this framework, which underlies uh, uh, a, a great deal of, 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 of our policy and decision analytics, um, can be very powerful for a wide range of problems, but under these conditions of deep uncertainty, it can break down. It can lead us to underestimate uncertainties, which can lead to brittle plans. Um, it can skew the way we think about problems towards the parts of it that we can predict better um, with, with higher confidence. Um, you know, a clear example of this is you know, focusing on means rather than extremes, even though the extremes may be a lot more important for decision making. And then it, in some sense, a real misallocation of effort where what we're really looking for is creative ways to enhance resilience, to reduce risk, um, which in part can be improved by better per, better predictions, reducing uncertainty, but is often um, uh, advanced by uh, clever um, and uh, new types of solutions. Um, here's the definition of deep uncertainty, where there's problems can arise. It's pretty consistent with what Linda showed, but basically where there's the parties to a decision do not know or do not agree on the likelihood of alternative futures, um, or how actions related to consequences, the, the system model across the, the, the full system. So what do we do? Um, a, a, a powerful way to address these situations is, I think of it as conducting the analysis backwards in the sense we start with the decision, start with what are we trying to achieve? What are ways to, to achieve that? And then use our analytics our, our information to stress test what we plan, looking essentially at under what conditions do the proposed actions reach, meet our goals, and how do they differentiate, or where do they miss the goals, and then use that information to identify new uh, revised plans that are more robust in the sense of uh, performing well over the full range of uncertainties. And the, the fundamental idea here is that we're using our science and analytics to produce, to focus on where we can provide higher confidence, high confidence information, for instance, where a particular set of actions might, might fail, um, as opposed to trying to understand exactly what future conditions might be. And th these sets of, of methods go into the broad heading of decision-making under deep uncertainty. And this is um, a recent book which um, uh, covers a whole wide of, of range of methods. And I'm going to touch on some of those with examples here. So let me um, 
Now dive in, not giving a broad survey of, of user uh, needs, but giving you a couple of examples, which I think are maybe helpful for our discussion. So this is um, some work we did a couple of years ago of, of a climate stress test on water quality uh, plans in, in the city of LA. Um, and in brief, they're, 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 the city's trying to meet federal water standards on the, um, on the Los Angeles River. Um, they went through the standard regulatory uh, assurance analysis, running hydrological models, um, a cross model of the cityscape, et cetera. Um, but the plan was made assuming stationary climate. They came up with an optimum distribution of, of resources to uh, between regional projects, spreading basins, that sort of thing. Green streets, which is uh, increasing the permeability of public infrastructure, and then low impact development, which is essentially changing building codes to affect the permeability of um, and water capture of uh, private infrastructure. Um, and they, as as I said, they they assumed a stationary climate. So in this analysis, we went in and looked. What are asked the question? What would the effect of uncertainty about land use changes? and climate change have on these plans. And just to give you a brief overview, um, took a, a, a broad ensemble of different climate projections. This was done at the time when CMIT-5 was uh, the, the set to use, and use this data to run a wide range of scenarios. Here are a couple of hundred, stress testing the plan over a whole a range of uh, different futures, which combine different land use and different climate change. You get something, a database that looks something like this, where a blue dot is the plan meets uh, water quality goals, a uh, red dot means it misses goals. You can then run uh, classification algorithms against the database and ask what are the, the key drivers, the key combinations of drivers which best distinguish between the conditions that give you a blue and a red dot. And the answer you get looks something like this, where it's uh, not surprisingly, uh, it's the 24 hour rainfall intensity and the impervious area of, of the city surface. And which, and then that line across the two uh, does a pretty good job, you know, actually the best job you can do with a straight line in this multi-dimensional space um, of distinguishing the red and the blue dots. And you get on the right, uh, the cases where the plan misses federal water standard on the left, where it does, the um, green X up there is the baseline conditions used in the plan. And so what you get from this is a sense of um, what combinations of land use and climate changes, in this case, the intensity of this, uh, the 24 hour rainfall, um, um, the, the the plan can take and what combinations which push the plan out of um, uh, compliance and given deep uncertainties in both these uh, both these drivers this is um, much higher confidence information um, you can now take this information and turn it into an adaptive plan one that's designed to monitor and respond and be robust to um, uh, these uncertainties. So this plan consists of a current actions, signposts to monitor, and contingent actions if signposts are observed. And so you get something like this to begin the current plan, looking out 20 years in the future. You monitor the uh, land use, so you're building permits, remote sensing, that sort of thing. And you monitor the climate, climate science to see what it says about the uh, extreme events. And um, if you see the signpost, you can um, augment the plan um, to, to work better in the red region. And if not, you can continue the current plan. And the idea here is this aims to describe a robust adaptive strategy with sufficient specificity to enable public accountability. And as you see here, the, the particular needs, uh, both regionally, this is a particular sub-watershed in um, in the LA Basin, the particular climate information is very contextual to the, um, uh, the, the particular need. And also there's this strong interplay. I mean, how well do you need to know the climate is not a standalone question, 
but is is tightly coupled to some of the socioeconomic uncertainties, which also drive the importance of the plan. Okay, um, the uh, the AR6 IPCC report um, uh, try to pick up some of these ideas in a fairly substantial way. Um, um, this is how AR6 working group one try to characterize sea level rise projections so that there's um, on the left, you see a, um, a probabilistic range of, of sea level rise projections going out to 2150. And then there's these um, uh, high end storyline estimates, which don't have probabilities on them, but are described um, by the by what we know about the sorts of processes that would lead to the, the conditions um, that would give you this um, essentially out of sample uh, sea level rise. So it's basically probabilistic estimates for the part we understand, but these um, science-driven storylines of uh, processes that would take, take one out of sample. Um, on the right is presenting this information not uh, by when, we might experience certain levels of sea level rise. And so there's panels for um, two different uh, socioeconomic emission scenarios. And then it shows when are the earliest and latest states under a variety of assumptions that, that you might get a certain amount of sea level rise. Um, the idea being that this, when does it occur is, um, use more decision relevant in a variety of uh, um, uh, contexts than how much do you get by a certain date? Two so, minutes. Okay, great, okay. So one way to, um, uh, uh, this sort of information is meant to inform uh, uh, adaptive plans. This is the uh, the adaptive plan for the, the Thames estu River estuary. And the idea is that uh, you see um, different levels of sea level rise, one meter, two meter, three meters, and a whole use, a whole variety of actions you could take um, uh, seeing these various um, uh, levels of sea level rise. So the this both the probabilistic estimates and the storylines provided um, in AR6 are meant to uh, inform this sort of analysis. Um, this is how AR6 um, try to use these adaptive pathways idea and link it to climate information. We can go back to that if we have time later. Just wanted then add, so one other thing um, here is this is um, uh, some recent work using expert elicitation to try to fill in uh, some of the gaps in climate model ensembles um, as part of one of these stress test plans. So this is the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission was performing climate stress tests of their system as part of their long range, um, long term vulnerability assessment. Um, and they used the CMIP-5 ensemble, which was the, the one available when they were doing this. But then we also did this expert elicitation where um, based on the stress test, the agency identified a variety of factors that would be um, potentially relevant to their decisions, but for whatever set of reasons, uncovered, not covered or not covered sufficiently well in, in the SEMA 5 ensemble. We recruited a number of uh, climate scientists, did an iterative Delphi process um, based on very specific questions the agency had put together. So just to give you an example, the sort of things that they were asking is they had three regions, very small, climate, uh, you know, geographic regions that were particularly important to their system, San Francisco Pe uh, Peninsula, East Bay, and then parts of the Sierras, essentially where Hetch Hetchy is, um, interested in both um, delta T and delta P averages, but also then uh, uh, seven different um, uh, other climate parameters having to do with drought, duration, depth, frequency of atmospheric rivers, um, which were then characterized for them in terms of how big the changes might be uh, using bins essentially that were um, connected to particular vulnerabilities of the system and then levels of confidence. So again, this emphasizes both the decision, you know, the, the specificity of the information often needed and the idea that the climate 
science community often has lots of information that is decision relevant, but may not be in a, a formal climate model ensemble. Um, and then just touching on this, which uh, uh, Linda had also mentioned, um, the this idea of, which again is, it, was put forward in AR or emphasized in AR6, the idea of, of complex and cascading risks versus is the, the risk propeller, which now has a additional blade to it, which is risks that are created by our by human responses um, to, to risks. So we've increased the, um, uh, the, the components of risk. And then this idea that risks compound and cascade um, with, so that the climate risk that we, we experience is not any one of the individual ones, but the um, combinations of a variety of different risk factors. And so this again is something that's gonna be very important for decision makers. So some quick observations, user needs are strongly context dependent, it can be shaped by the design of the response. I emphasize adaptive pathways here. Climate's one of many relevant uncertainties, which uh, uh, is important for how we think about uncertainty and its uh, presentation. High confidence information is often not the most decision relevant. And this idea of climate stress tests to identify particular combinations of factors that would cause vulnerabilities to current systems or planned systems can be very, very useful in thinking about the most decision relevant combinations of uncertainties. Thank you. We can take questions. I can probably start with one question. No. So, I mean, th this stress testing uh, kind of approach um, as compared to the predict and then act is very interesting and I really believe very relevant. Uh, but at the same time, in the example you presented, um, of course, was a simplified. You mm -hmm. had a percent in previous area and 24 hour total precipitation. I have to know a lot about the system and do um, uh, identification of the parameters that are most relevant before I even proceed in the stress <laughs> test. Yeah. So that, that, that can be a complex process, but at the same time, I agree with you, is much better and more system relevant than the predict and then act. Can, can you add any more insight? Um, well, I, I agree with everything you said. And the example I showed um, um, actually involved running a, a, a fairly detailed uh, system simulation against a whole variety of, um, uh, you know, an ensemble of climate uh, projections and then doing a statistical analysis to, to see what to put, you know, what, what to put on those axes. So yeah, I know it, it did require a complex system model. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, one of the places I think the, the, the field is, is going is um, as we gather um, example cases, um, um, we're starting to learn, you know, what are important in particular, you know, starting to learn how to develop a taxonomy of, of what, what sort of situations, what sorts of things are likely to be important. And so one can do that by looking across lots of these use cases. And there's also some interesting work going on where people are trying to come up with different classes of abstract cases and trying to understand. So this is actually, I think, an area that could be really useful from research is how do we, um, uh, you know, how, how do we develop taxonomies of cases um, so that not everybody has to do the full really complicated analysis to get a sense of, of what a stress test might look like for their system. Thank you. More questions? I don't see if they're, yep. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of new work that's gone on in numerical weather prediction that uses adjoint sensitivity to determine what's going on in a forecast model as an initial condition perturbation that leads to a forecast in error or, you know, in, in some other perturbation from what you expect. Can you do adjoint sensitivities on your prediction models? And is that kind of what you're describing without using those words? Um, uh, I I'm not super familiar with the, you know, the, the, the these methods you you suggested, so I'm not sure. Um, but um, um, what 
what we're doing there and, and the, the work I should, people, there's a lot of work in the style that I'm showing that uses various sort of stochastic weather generators to, um, to stress test the system, finds the, um, uh, the vulnerabilities and then interrogates that back against um, what's, what's understood from the models or in the case I showed from expert elicitation of, of experts. So I, um, does that, does that help you answer the question? I think so. I'm not an expert in this. Michael Morgan is. It's too bad he's not still here. He'd have better follow-up questions than I am than I have. But yeah, that sounds right. Stress testing may, might be just another way to describe some of the same principles. It's kind of interesting. Okay. Which to me again means that this approach emphasizes understanding a system, whatever that system is, the best we can. I mean, mm -hmm. you cannot stress a system and get uh, results on vulnerability without understanding the system. <laughs> yeah. So forward modeling in the system, whatever, whatever LA, water quality, or whatever forward mm -hmm. accurate modeling is a very fundamental component mm -hmm. of that approach, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Linda. Yes, thanks, Evie. So, Rob, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I So providing individual examples is really great in terms of really mm -hmm. demonstrating how the method works. Um, I guess it's kind of like, you know, my concern is how do we actually <laughs> produce a resilient society. Mm -hmm. um, and is there any way to do this beyond taking many, many, many cases? In other words, can this be generalizable in a way? Or, or is it the only way to have you know a plan for the LA Basin, a plan for Santa Barbara, uh, a plan for the Imperial Valley and so forth. I, I worry about um, how this method could be more general generalizable. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I mean, certainly. Just to rephrase your your concern a little bit, um, that I mean, you know, all, all those places you mentioned and many more are all going to have plans. I mean, that's what they do. Um, the, um, the, the question, um, is can they develop their plans without doing a lot more work than they're currently doing, but make them a lot more climate resilient? Um, and so what, when you try to write, say, guidances for, for these sorts of things, you, you often end up with, with screening processes, um, which, you know, say, which, which try to abstract from um, the cases that have been done um, and turn it into um, you know, a series of questions that can say, you know, if you can answer these questions, then here's what you should do. This is what a, a full-blown climate stress test would tell you, but you don't need to do it because you're in a situation where we kind of know what the answer is going to be. And then... You have maybe have like three categories, three or four categories of these things where you can, you know, simply you your system is sufficiently like others, sufficiently simple that you can pretty much know what the answer is going to be, and you can go on from there. Uh, intermediate ones where you may need to do some sorts of analyses, uh, but you can pretty quickly get to an answer, and then more elaborate ones. Um, where it becomes much more difficult. So again, um, uh, trying to understand how to map, you know, map, map different situations into these broad classes, I think is one of the things that's needed to, to make this sort of work, uh, you know, easily disseminatable across, um, you know, all the both, all the agencies, both small and large, um, who have to have to act in order to to give us a climate ready nation? Uh, I was told that we have to move on. Unfortunately, okay. 
So, uh, Bob, do you mind putting your question in the chat box? Sorry about that, but I follow instructions. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much. Uh, we have our next speaker, Klaus Keller. Uh, Klaus is the Hanson Distinguished Professor of Engineering at Dartmouth College. Uh, he, before joining Dartmouth, he was at Penn State University, where he was the director of the Center for Climate Risk Management. His research addresses two interrelated questions. First, how can we mechanistically understand past and pot potentially predict future changes in the Earth system? And second, how can we use this information to design sustainable, scientifically sound, technologically feasible, and economically efficient risk management strategies? Um, Klaus received his master's in environmental engineering from MIT and his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Princeton University. So Klaus is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation and the great discussion so far. Um, I tried to make three simple points. Number one, climate change drives risks under deep dynamic uncertainties. And the key here is dynamic uncertainties, and Rob discussed this very much. Second, improving the characterization and communication of climate risk can improve decisions. And three, the most important one, starting with decision makers' needs can inform the design and mission-oriented basic climate research. Um, and I'd like to start always with decision problems, because I think it's helpful to focus our attention. This is a picture of the Industrial Canal flood wall in New Orleans. I think Rob was actually the same excursion here. And people build a levee. And the question is, how high would you like to build a levee? If you look at then what are the hazards are in terms of water levels, it becomes pretty clear that, let's say, the 100 year return period um, has not just uncertainty, which is a probably density function, but there's deep uncertainty, meaning there are subjective choices that can lead to multiple PDFs. And it's not quite clear which one you would like to take or picking just one leads to underestimation. And if you start with a hypothetical levy, then the risks of overtopping, of course, is a tail area event and it's deeply uncertain. And so the uncertainties are deep and neglecting uncertainty, for example, adopting the best guess estimate here underestimates risk because the best guess scenario, you are safe, but with the uncertainty, you are not safe because you have flooded. So a very simple point. A slightly more complex point is that most models that are used to assess climate hazards that are general circulation models only sample a small range of the parameter space. They cut off tails. Uh, if you see here the climate sensitivity, uh, the range of the last, not the current one, but the previous one, CMIP estimates, uh, is not covering the full range of other estimates that use simpler models and can sample the tails. So if bad things happen in the upper tail, which there is good physical reason that they are predominantly the upper tail of climate sensitivity, then relying only on the existing generation of high resolution models has potential issues because you're blind to the upper tail area events. And the third point here is that this isn't just an academic esoteric class beat game discussion. This can be brought really much to, to, to bear. Here's analysis of what is the return period of flooding uh, for New Orleans for an existing approximated levy design. And what you have here is the return period of years. The certification is for better than 100 years here. Uh, but the point here is that how the water height is depends as Rob really nicely said on the sea level on storms activities, but also on parameters of ice sheets or how much we drive emissions as human choices. And so if you then uh, basically make different choices, here are 18 scenarios that we a priori cannot really say which one is better. Some of them actually, they all are an expected value in the median value better than one in 100. But for critical infrastructure like hospitals, you wanna have one in 500. And for that, it doesn't always work uh, because some scenarios work and some do not work. And so neglecting deep uncertainty can change decisions. Towards the second point, and slowing down slightly, is that improving the characterization and communication of climate risk can improve decisions. 
Let's have another example problem. This is a picture taken in a rural community in Pennsylvania. Uh, the pig, uh, person in the front is the first author of the paper we discussed soon. And people elevate houses. And the question is, how high would you like to elevate your house? So it turns out, uh, elevating a house, there's a recommendation. FEMA gives you a recommendation to give you a basic elevation plus a certain free board, and then you have to pass a course benefit test. From a decision vertical point of view, what you would like to do often is that you could consider, for example, reliability. Let's say your never flood is 100%. And investment cost, um, and the ideal point, of course, you pay nothing and you're safe, which is the star here. But that's not possible in this region because you flood a lot and houses do get flooded. As you increase investment, then of course, you get high reliability, but you have a decreasing return of invest. So you basically have here a parade of front, which separates the dominated space where you can improve towards the infeasible space, which you cannot do. If we neglect uncertainty, then the best decision here is to elevate uh, by a certain amount and you get it. However, this is the approximation what FEMA tells you or the decision rule, this neglects uncertainties. If you account for uncertainties, your parade front actually deteriorates and you have issues and you actually change the conclusion. So from this decision here, the dotted line, which neglects uncertainty to the dotted line, you actually have a change and the optimal decision also changes. So a very simple point that accounting for uncertainties in this case about the geophysical hazard, but also about engineering and economics like discount rate changes the decision. The motivating questions for the session, we're also focusing on how do we design and communicate? And I think it's important for us when we have a climate ready nation design as an objective to actually take stock of what we have, what real people can see for climate risk information. What we have done here in a recent study is we look at certain flood risk information sources, and here are studies or risk rating 2.0, flood factor, as well as academic studies. And on the, this side here, um, on the uh, rows, we have actually components. So we would like to integrate climate change. We would have volume exposure there. with simplicity, transparency. Do we have open access? And is it legally accepted? And as color coded by dark blue is best, and light blue is, is bad, or it's room for growth, let's be more polite. And what you can see is that there is no single product which is dark blue across. And so a an user in search of information has to navigate somewhat harsh trade-offs in terms of which product they would like to use. There is no product that in our assessment passes the fundamental quality criteria you would like to have for an um, sound, transparent, accessible infant flood risk information source. Maybe more importantly, in addition, we have to engage also with psychologists and people who are experts in computer human actions information design, because the way we communicate information impacts the way people perceive hazards and risks and how they make decisions. And this, in the same paper this I discussed before, we compare in a stylized way how people these days actually get the flood information. So the, on the left side, there's this standard flood zone, like the FEMA flood insurance rate map, where you have one in 100 and one in 500 rates, and you're either in or you're out in certain zones. Other studies recognize that this framing is a problem because if you're in the 1% zone, you could be 1% or two or three or four, you could be higher. Basically, the boundary you have is the lower bound of this current classification. And so for house number one, basically, yes, you are in the one, but actually because you, only, you are not at the very edge of the line, you have a much higher flood risk. And so, Having a different way to plot things, it's more complex, but it's also more, more information content and it might change decisions. The third one, of course, is that certain um, entities provide flood factors and give you a score for your house. And they can look at those places 
And you could, for example, be in, a pro in an area like here, this house here in panel C, which is green, and you're fine. The problem being that if you want to need to go to the hospital here, then you don't know uh, from just those, uh, from the presented information that you could not go, for example, through the road to get to the hospital. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that not only is there a problem in how we design information and how we navigate trade-off between being inclusive of many factors and understandable, but also the way we communicate has an impact. And it, we shouldn't just leave it to the climate and science nerds, no offense, you know, I'm, I'm one myself, to actually think about how we communicate this. Uh, wrapping up and coming to the third point, and this is the most important one, it really, and this is also in terms of the, the the vision of this session this afternoon, starting with decision-maker needs can help to inform the design of mission-oriented basic climate research. So let's come back to the decision problem of how high to build a levy. And let's step back also how this often is being done. And this is very much mimicking Rob's uh, approach of doing it inverse, but now inverse in the science design as opposed to decision design. In the process from the IPCC and many other assessments, we start with working group one, what are the stakes? Then we say, well, what are the risks and the odds? We do working group two, and then we say, what are we gonna do about decision analysis? And they're sequential. And we start with one and two and three. And once you do decision analysis, you wanna go back and they say, oh, sorry, uh, come back in five to six years because we're not really doing anything else uh, for this assessment. The, Potential here is that you have to make choices where you focus. And this is where I think it's helpful. Uh, uh, Linda had a very nice top dog and cat analogy. When you sometimes look at dogs, they bark up a tree to go for a cat, but they're barking up, they're not very smart, they're barking up the wrong tree. And the issue is, are we as natural scientists barking up the right tree? Because there are many, many trees we can bark at and we can look at. And so one approach is to actually do this in an inverse sense, where you start with the decision analysis and then ask the questions, which parameters and uncertainty sources from the earth science component are actually driving the variance in the decision maker objectives. This is illustrated in this figure here, where we look at the question of which factors drive the variance in the flooding probability and driven by the next 30 years of building a levy. This is a very specific decision. And what we have is a somewhat complex model, which is joint probability function. And we do what is called a global sensitivity analysis. It is not a joint. It is a Sobel's method to do the global variance decomposition. And we have different factors like glacial ice caps, a temperature model. We have then, of course, a CO2 emissions. We have storm surge, Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet. And we partition over the how much the uncertainty each parameter with interaction terms drive the uncertainty and the variance in the objective of the in the metric of the risk of overtopping next 30 years. And what we see is that the big balls here are the important ones. If it's not showing, it's not significant. And if there are connections then with interesting interaction terms. And yes, building how much we actually build is important, but the storm surge uncertainty is much more important. And the Antarctic ice sheet is important. So here, for example, the Greenland ice sheet is not very much important. This does not mean that there is no inherent virtue in studying the Greenland ice sheet. It only means that for this specific decision problem and this decision setup, for short-term decision, when you have to pour concrete every 30 to 70 years, uh, the Greenland ice sheet is not fast enough and or the uncertainty is not fast enough compared to other uncertainties. The question then is, what does this mean for the design of mission to basic research? Well, if it's just curiosity driven, every parameter is fine. If it's have a mission driven to form this decision for climate radiation, then maybe we want to focus on those uncertainties matter for the decision which have and which actually move the needle here. Stepping back and coming to the conclusion, I think it is time, and many people have recognized this, to shift gears. Often when students are educated, 
we have this classic model of prior knowledge, lines of evidence, system model, we do some Bayesian data model fusion with outcomes and predictions. That's the part we, we say, but the problem is that this misses interactions. The reason is that the outcomes are compared to values. The values are used to define metrics. The metrics then inform the choice of strategies for decision-making and the strategies then interact with the system model. And of course, uh, the design of your learning means that the outcomes can feed in back as line as evidence to an update. Now, this means that how we optimize the system model and where we elicit priors here has to account for the directions we have by decision-making. And if you want to do this to inform the values and the metrics, then the choice of where to focus here is not value free. It is something where we, in my view, it is helpful to be explicit about value choices and be deliberate about which choices we do. And with that, I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, um, send me an email and I'm happy to look forward for your discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Klaus. We have one question by Neil. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I'll have to say, if my terrier says there's, there's a squirrel up a tree, it's up at that tree. Um, so I don't know about this barking up the wrong you tree have, thing. You have a smarter dog. <laughs> the uh, she's pretty sure of herself in that regard. Um, the the I, I I mean this a lot of this is music to my ears and the kind of Granger Morgan front and you know especially the normative values and everything else. Yeah. But uh, what I struggle with is the is the you know, I, I might I might call it the the sort of front wheel drive version of of decision making and uncertainty, and so where we want what we what we need to know guides the uh, guides the car. But we also have in society this enormous preponderance of confirmation bias, right? And the appearance that a lot of our decision makers look to find the experts that will confirm what they want to do anyway. Yeah. Uh, at a distance, these two things seem awfully similar. So, I, I, and I understand that they're not, but what what's the communication space around that, around differentiating, getting the, 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 the necessary information from framing the decision ahead versus just going out and looking for what confirms what you want to do anyway? Neil, this is a great question. Sorry to make an obvious point, but uh, you're right. So let me make, try to make two points. Number one, just to reiterate, I am not saying that the fundamental signs should be abandoned. Of, or abandoned. of course not. There is, we can only, we need to look over the horizon and we need to have the serendipity of discovery, uh, which is how we find out new things. However, what I am saying is that if your objective in a mission agency is to inform decisions, then there are choices which are uh, given you subjective choice and your values, this is important, we come back to this, have different rankings, how important they are in form the decision. Uh, and the second point here is it comes back to this, the values. Whose values are we talking about? Um, when you, I can send you papers, uh, there are many papers on Rob Lampert and others where offers on, on similar studies. Um, it, often starts with engaging with the stakeholder decision makers at the location. So this is not, let me be really blunt. Uh, it is in my view, not really promising if you ask a um, climate scientist at an Ivy League university, what would be really relevant to inform decision making on evacuation in New Orleans. Just to be really clear here. Uh, the local experts and academic experts have different mental models and you know this very well. And we need to align them and understand this. And they have also different values. And so the concept of value for mental models and engage with decision makers and have a traceable account is something which is really important. You know, Bob Cobb is on this, on this uh, call and Linda and, and Rob, uh, and they do this way better than, than, than many of us. But I think it's really clear to be explicit and clear and traceable and transparent about which values are those. So what I did not show, for example, is that I showed this, this spider diagram of the silver analysis for one decision. For other decisions and other objectives, it looks very different. And so, for example, if you are concerned about biodiversity preservation, 
for 400 years, then of course Greenland is important. It makes perfect sense, yes? And so what I'm trying to say here, maybe not very well, is that what you val which parameter value is important depends on the values that you have in the decision. And the values are sometimes the values of the decision makers or sometimes the values of the physical scientists who do the analysis. But I would argue to be salient and relevant, we should actually, it is potentially more useful to focus on the value of the people which are impacted as opposed to the values you do the analysis in an ivory tower. So I, I, I don't want to spell this out too much, but I, I hope it's more clear now. Thank you. Steven. Uh, so we go to Steven, who will um, read some questions from the chat, from the public. Yes, yeah, so we, in parallel, we have um, a, an opportunity for public to ask questions. And I just want to raise up some uh, questions that are related to what was just raised. One was about um, coming from a decision maker standpoint, a specific decision decides the modeling and what parameters you're considering. And sort of how do we know that we're considering the right decisions and the right decision makers when asking that question? Um, and then a second one is uh, about more about time scales and just noting that the, the um, warming or climate change needs to be considered a geologic time and how does that fit with decision, the decision frame and timing of, of um, speakers. Mainly wanna raise those up if you have some brief responses before we move on to the next I speaker. will try to be brief. Those are excellent questions. So which decision to choose? Um, well, that is to some extent co-designed by the decision makers, stakeholders and the researchers. Uh, there are decisions which are for mission agencies really important, like where to put nuclear power stations uh, and where to put hospitals. That's certainly something or how to build a levy. Those are decisions where we as a society invest a lot of money. And it's not my choice. I'm not elected official. Um, I vote, I'm citizen of this nation. But uh, the point is that the decisions, in my view, are to some extent the choice of the people who made the decisions and where this is. However, there is very good research on where decision analysis can actually be useful to, to improve and certain classification. There's Ben Hobbs and others have done really excellent work on that. Uh, just, I can put it into the, the chat afterwards to the work by Ben Hobbs and others. Um, and the second point of the timescales Yes, you're right. Uh, there are timescales which are, you know, operational on a day to, to the week, to more tactical, to really strategic and long-term on multi-decadal. What I've shown here are multi-decadal timescales, home elevation, as well as levee building, um, or putting pipes in the ground, because this is where there is relatively little flexibility. If you can adjust, then uh, it is hard, but whenever you put things in the ground and timescales which are, which are relevant to climate change, this is where the, the climate change timescale potentially interacts with the timescale of your decision. And so finding uh, problems that are helpful. And I just want to um, point out to the question and the suggestion of Rob, yes, we cannot do an analysis of one year of postdoc time for each house we elevate. This is not going to work. Uh, what we potentially is helpful is to find, can we find archetypal, can we find typical rules that work well in most cases, empirical rules, and where we can actually influence the engineer design standards to say, is it because engineers do designs all the time, they follow rules, they follow handbooks. And how to update those, in my view, is actually one of the larger challenges, but also an opportunity for us to mainstream the findings from people like Rob and Linda and, and other people. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. And uh, Klaus, very quickly, in, in the simple example that you had with the uh, circle and the variables yeah. of importance, I assume that in a real system, it has to be a dynamic thing because amplifications, yeah. bound events. Yep, 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 yep. So then, this yeah, was, so. when you have 15 minutes and I try to abide by the time limit, you can only do very little. Uh, there are now time dependent, there are people who have movies, yes. Uh, it gets complicated really fast. I, I wanted you to do it, you know, Camel Snow is easy, does it first. And uh, if you want to have, I can also have a few papers where it's time dependent. I can put them into the, the chat afterwards. Thank you. I look. I will look them up. 
So uh, thank you very much. Um, we have our third speaker now, uh, Jennifer Jacobs. Uh, she's a professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, her research focuses on characterization of hydrologic processes, distributed hydrologic modeling in all of its components, evapotranspiration, soil water dynamics, snow melt, uh, stream water and energy, uh, both through modeling and experimentation. Uh, she has been a community leader, uh, especially in QASI, the Consortium of University for the Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences, and she is leading an NSF project on a research coordination network for climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, she got a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering from Brown University and her PhD in civil engineering from Cornell. So Jennifer. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me today. And it's it's been wonderful to sit around the table and to hear all the exciting work that's going on. And I really appreciate the work that Rob and Claus and Linda introduced. And now I'm gonna take it into a little bit more granularity. And uh, as Epi introduced, I'm a surface water hydrologist. And my role over the past 10 years or so has been spanning the boundary between the climate change scientists and the transportation engineers. And so the water people can kind of fill that role rather nicely. And so I'm gonna put on my transportation hat. And I'm going to lead you a little bit into that sector and how that sector is thinking about climate change and about uncertainty. So with a quick, let's see if we can get this to move. There we go. There we go. So first of all, I'm going to introduce civil engineering to you. You got to know a little bit about the sector in order to be able to understand what's going on. Then I'm going to talk about uncertainty in that sector, and in particular in transportation. And then I'm going to go through a series of brief examples of where we've thought about uncertainty and wrap up with trends, gaps, and opportunities. Okay, so here's, here's how we play with it. This is a picture of, bridge, of a bridge that's being built or that was being built in my hometown of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And it's a great example of every discipline has a bunch of sub-disciplines. And so within civil and environmental engineering, we have water resources, environmental, pavement, structures, geotech, transportation, sometimes coastal engineering, um, and sometimes mm -hmm. others. So if we look at that bridge as a system, the bridge part that's being floated in that you see, that's known as the, as the superstructure. And that's what our structural engineers are going to take care of. What supports that bridge is known as the substructure. And that's the foundation part. That's what our geotechnical engineers are going to take care of. The pavement engineers, those are the ones that are going to put the black stuff or the white stuff on top of the roadway and connect that bridge into the adjacent roadways. The transportation engineers are the ones that make certain that that bridge works within the entire system. And the water resources engineers are the ones that tell you how big, how tall to make that bridge, how wide an opening to make that in order to pass that design flood, whether it's current or future. The environmentals typically don't have a role in transport except possibly to inform the environmental regulations on where we can and cannot permit um, some growth. All right, so that sets our stage. So now we're gonna move into civil engineering. We're working on the dry side. Environmental and water resources are the wet side. And we'll talk about transport, transportation. So transportation is, well, I overheard somebody's conversation saying, I drove to the Metro station to take the Metro here. You guys all know what transportation is. You use it on a daily basis. It is an absolutely crucial component of our daily lives, uh, collectively, both individually, but also in the delivery of goods and services. And when it breaks down, you hear about it. We have, this is a community that's a large community. I think most of us go to the American Geophysical Union meeting there is a TRB meeting that meets in, in January in uh, Washington, D.C., and that meeting is as large or larger than the AGU meeting, which is for the transportation engineering community. So it's a very large community that's taking care of a lot of assets, and I've listed some of those here. Four, over 4 million miles of roads, 600,000 bridges, 136 miles of rail, 136,000 miles of rail, 20,000 airports, 900 ports, and many, many other assets are, that are combined. There's a lot of things in play with the transportation community. The transportation community also has a number of attributes that make it a really important part of interacting with the changing climate and interacting with the climate change community. The first piece is that everything that we're building today is designed to last. 
And so if we put something in the ground today that is not climate ready, it's going to be in the ground for anywhere from 10 to 100 years not being climate ready. So we've got these lifetimes that are very similar to climate change lifetimes within transportation engineering. The other thing that we know is that infrastructure is already being impacted by the changing climate. When we see extreme events, changing extreme events, oftentimes what you're seeing are bridges that are blown out, roadways that are damaged. And so we see the infrastructure because that's what impacts people. We have 12,000 miles of coastal roads that are currently experiencing high tide flooding. And this is only going to get worse. We have a lot of vulnerable assets. All right, so uncertainty. The transportation community is no stranger to uncertainty. We've been thinking about this from the get-go. However, we don't typically use the term uncertainty. And as a bridge engineer explained to me, you don't really want to tell the public that you're not certain about whether or not that bridge is going. Yeah, you get the idea. And so more often we frame it as risk or reliability, the inverse of the inverse of risk. Transportation assets are designed, built, and maintained in a manner that most decisions involve some sort of degree of uncertainty. And yet you still need to build that bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge was built long before we knew how to do design rainfall and flood forecasting and modeling, and yet it's still standing. And so the engineering community will take that information into account when they do their designs. And so the engineering mindset is that good designs do not fail. And design standards are something that we rely on. And Claus mentioned this very briefly. A bridge engineer, when he or she is designing that bridge, is going to use one of these codes that's over here. And they are not going to deviate from those codes unless there is an extremely, extremely good reason. How are these codes developed? They're developed by the American Society of Civil Engineers or like type organizations, typically by volunteer groups that meet quarterly, annually. And so design standards change on the order of 10 years or longer. And so if we were to definitively say we should be changing the bridge because the climate change community now knows how to do three second wind gust, then that change would not take place likely in for another decade. So we've got a long lag time here. The design standards provide lots of different specifications that account for uncertainties. A lot of them have absolutely nothing to do with climate. The place where climate comes into play is going to be in, in the loading. So a loading on a bridge, it could be the heavy vehicle, how much does it weigh? But also the other part of loading is the environmental loads. So wind speed, rainfall, um, precipitation, uh, heat, those all will come into environmental loads. And so that's the place where the climate scientists can inform transportation engineering. All right, so where do we sit now? Uh, I was saying to someone over lunch, it's a little bleak right now in the transportation community. There's a lot of opportunities, but it's we are not including climate change in most of our engineering practice at this point in time. Very little. And partly is that there's limited reliable guidance for how to adapt infrastructure to guide agency practice current practice and institutions, not the design guidelines, but the institutions themselves. How does the State Department of Transportation work? Those institutions aren't designed to take in the information that's coming out of this community and to use it in a coherent way. There's like any other community, there's different silos, there's planning, there's operations, there's design and maintenance. And the environmental people who are usually the people that were the early adopters of climate change considerations are an entirely different division than the engineers that are doing the design work. The existing tools, Rob has wonderful work. It's amazing. I would take it and put it in a heartbeat into our systems if we possibly could. But that's not how it's being done in practice. Right now, we're still doing top-down types of approaches, looking at what the future climate entails, and employing them to determine a relative order of magnitude of what to expect in the future. All right, so let's move on to a couple of examples so we can give a little granularity to what I'm talking about. Flooding. If you ask any State Department of Transportation, maybe aside from Arizona and California, uh, what the number one problem is, they'd say flooding. 
they would say flooding. And there's both riverine inland flooding as well as coastal flooding. So let's take our first example for inland flooding. And that is currently what we're doing is we're, we've looked to NOAA and NOAA has updated our design precipitation using Atlas 14. And so that was updated after about 30 years going back in history. It took a large lift to get that updated. And so the agencies are incredibly happy to have updated estimates of, client, of precipitation for their design standards. There is no national guidance on future design precipitation. And yet I would gather, I bet that every state agency's Department of Transportation knows about the NCA4, different graphs, the, CS, the climate science special report that shows how climate, how precipitation is changing. They know that design precipitation is going up. And so engineers want to make the right decision. And so we might be bound by these guidelines, but if we know the future is changing, we're trying to juggle that act of how do we increase that precipitation? Okay. So don't look too closely at this. <laughs> I'm gonna give you one example from a state not to be named. And I wanna point out a couple of things. The first thing that I'm gonna point out is the second column. And this is new from, for based upon the changing climate. Before we looked at all of our different assets that we might be designed that could potentially flood, and we just said, are we going to design for a 10-year event, a 25-year event, 100-year, 500-year? Now what we're doing is we're looking at the criticality of assets and saying maybe that culvert isn't so important. If it floods once in a while, we're okay with that. But that signature, that signature bridge, we can't afford to lose that. And so what we're developing, most agencies are developing tiers, maybe, maybe three tiers, maybe four tiers. In this case, tier one would be our, we can afford to have it flood. Tier three would be, don't let it happen. Don't let, don't let that go. So that's actually a really important change in these disciplines, being able to account for the reliability that we need from different assets. The other thing, this is the Wild West analogy. Every state is doing something different, if anything at all, for trying to figure out how to do design precipitation. And I think this is really an opportunity for this community. The first one, the NOAA Atlas 14, that's our present day standard. NOAA Plus use, doesn't use any climate model output. It uses the 90th percentile of the upper 90th confidence interval of the estimates from NOAA. I know you're cringing. Okay. <laughs> All right, but this is, I'm, I'm trying to give you a sense as to where we are, which is very different from some of, I think, what we were talking about this morning. The uh, fourth one, the 2030 uh, NCHRP, National Cooperative Highway Research Program, 1561, that's a document that was a research project that developed approaches to be able to use global climate model output, depending upon whether, uh, how vulnerable that asset um, is or is not. And it used a number of different approaches in order to be able to estimate what future, what future rainfall was at a number of different time periods. Um, that's got some legs underneath it. And so the state here adopted both the combination of NOAA plus for political reasons, as well as for, for good reasons, and NCHRP 1561. They have they, that stood for about three years, and they have now revised their design standards to use something called the, the Cornell projections, which would be a weather model simulation. So we're not using any climate model output of precipitation, but we're simulating the weather using, large, using upper atmosphere conditions in order to estimate design precipitation. Okay, maybe. Uh, that might work. But this tells, yeah, we're getting, we have a range of different approaches that we're taking. All right, next one, let's go coastal. Coastal has been at it for the longest time period. So with coastal, if we start on the far left, we go to previous work. And this is where sea level rise scenarios come in. The coastal community in the transportation world use those sea level rise scenarios, conduct a GIS analysis, map out, find out where the vulnerable sections of roadways, bridges, and other assets are, prioritize those based upon criticality. Maybe are they close to a hospital? Are they an evacuation route? Uh, are they in a vulnerable neighborhood? Uh, they do specific site assessments for those particular assets. And then they move into network analysis. And in the network analysis, they might look at that entire system and then make adaptation options, ad adaptation recommendations. 
Two minutes. Where the climate community comes in is in this previous work. And again, this is a different state. And here what they've done is they've indicated the tolerance for flood risk. And so different assets will have different tolerance for flood risk. And so they will have different design guidelines for sea level rise. Okay, take home on this one. Climate model output is synthesized into a single number that is based upon measures of criticality. Example three, we'll make this short and sweet. We know the CMIP scenarios. We know the CMIP projects. We have an increasing number of global climate models. If we plot them all out, precipitation over time, what we see is a whole different possible futures, which is right. We know that none of them is correct and that we should be using a number of different models as well as different emission scenarios. We also should be sensitive to the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So what guidance are transportation engineers being given regarding how to pick models? Because I can tell you, they're not going to use 50 models. So the same NCHRP 1561 guide came up with, took all of the CMIP 3 and CMIP 5 models and organized them into groups. Group one was tried and true. Group two would be modifications to existing models um, that may or may not play out. And group three was new kids on the block or, the, or people are trying something radically new. And what the recommendation was is use group one models and make certain that you get a range of, of equilibrium sen uh, sensitivities. So get low, medium and high. If you're going to only pick three, pick, pick one from each of those. All right, so take home on that. We haven't done this for CMIP 6. Guidance is needed on how to select models. And so going to the Bureau of Reclamation site and picking the top one is probably not the best approach. But my guess is if you looked at a lot of studies, the top couple of models that happen to show up on those tools are the ones that, are being, that have gotten more play than other ones that happen to be at the bottom. All right, quick one at the end. Model physics are not always perfect and stakeholders sometimes have different questions than temperature and precipitation. Winters, winters cover half of the globe. They have large transitions in both water, energy and carbon cycles and they matter a lot to transportation. Within that landscape, we have this lovely network of roads. That's what's being shown up there for the New England area. 70% of the US roads are in areas that get ice, snow and are frozen part of the time. Whether we get ice or whether we get snow makes a huge difference. And so the other thing is we've got large budgets. We spend about $2 billion a year on winter activities for our US highway agencies or about 20% of their overall budget. So after floods, winter maintenance, winter, winter challenges come into play. All right, so how do climate models do in winter? If anybody's taken a look at them, not particularly well. We get reasonably good agreement among the models and with some cases where we've got a fair amount of variability among the models. On the right-hand side, those shows us what our problem is. Our models tend to underpredict snow and it melts too early as compared to what's measured. And we also, and because of that, we tend to have models that have soils that are too cold as opposed to what we observe in what we observe in fact. And so there's an opportunity for improving model physics in this area, which just happens to be an area that I do research in. But my guess is there's other areas that if you were to ask the stakeholders things that they wanted, thresholds that they needed, they extend beyond precipitation and temperature. OK, so bottom line, we need some additional. There are some areas for reliable physics where we could improve in the models. OK, so to wrap up. There's trends, there's gaps, there's opportunities. I'm gonna point at uh, just a couple. And the first one I'm gonna point at is the built funds are coming in. And the PROTECT program just got released. The first call, the due dates are in August. And what that means is we finally got some money at the state and federal level to deal with our transportation and climate change issues, which is huge for us. Uh, but the challenge is that the expertise and the capacity is limited within those agencies. One of my state partners at our recent meeting said that they have a 40% vacancy age vacancy rate at their agency. 40% of their positions aren't filled. There's also wide disparity in resources and efforts. And so the NSF speaker this morning said, you can have these programs, but if they don't get to the right people, the communities that really need them, the underserved communities, we're going to have challenges. We also recognize that the pace of change within transportation is not keeping up with the pace of change of climate change. And so people I think are familiar with ecosystems, wetlands, salt marsh migration, species being able to migrate. We've got a transportation community that can't migrate, mm -hmm. is not migrating fast enough. 
Uh, I've already talked a little bit about some of the gaps and we've hit um, some of the challenges are not just the magnitude, but also how long does it last? What's the scale? How does our system break down? And then the final pieces are, I would encourage you to take a look at what the PROTECT program is offering because there's some real wonderful opportunities for synergy, for developing tools with partners, for increasing, for working with partners to increase the resilience of those systems and strengthening uh, the vulnerable evacuation routes. So I'll stop there and I will thank the National Science Foundation who has been wonderful in supporting this work and developing these partnerships over the past decade, as well as acknowledging my collaborators throughout the ICNET community. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, with this, we could talk the whole afternoon about uh, everything you presented here, but for the interest of time, we'll take only one question and I see the hand of John uh, and then we'll take a short break, John. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, I'm not an I'm not a transportation engineer, but I've been told that there's a desire to the metric is how many cars can be moved rather than how many people can be moved. And I'm wondering under these conditions of extreme flooding and freezing and end climate ex uncertainty of climate extremes, how much are transportation engineers thinking of a step change to say, you know, we got a lot of roads out there. Maybe they should be elevated rail, uh, you know? So I'm just wondering, are, are, are the transportation engineers with climate extremes thinking that we need to not redo the same system and to think differently uh, and, and get away from asphalt and roads? That's a great question. And I, I wish I had a, a really good answer for that one. <laughs> uh, I think we're in a world of incremental change at this point, and we haven't reached that point of transformational change. Uh, there are certainly people that are very much thinking about this and proposing changes but I think we're gonna be in the world of incremental change and worrying about the existing assets for, um, for the near future. Thank you. And um, I think we'll stop here. We'll take, we're five minutes late. So we take five minutes break and we'll be back at uh, 2.50 or with 3.50. 2.50. Oh, I, I changed my watch uh, wrong. <laughs> from California. All right. Uh, so I'll see you in five minutes. We're, we're restarting with our next session. And I'd um, like to invite Libby, Libby Barnes, to um, moderate the next session. Hi everybody, thank you. So I'm Elizabeth Barnes or Libby. I am a professor of atmospheric science at Colorado State University. And I will be moderating session two here. So we've just heard from three speakers about decision-making and all of whom at some point during their slides have mentioned climate models or climate projections or climate predictions. So in this session, we have three speakers who will be discussing specifically uncertainties in climate modeling itself. And specifically the guiding questions for this session as shown on the screen here, are what are the sources of uncertainty in climate modeling? Um, what sources are most important to quantify and or reduce imp and improve predictions and projections or uncertainties in predictions and projections? What are the low hanging fruit for reducing uncertainties? Are there particular types that may be more or less challenging to reduce? And finally, how may, may decision-making needs inform the development and use of climate models. So um, just I'll give very brief introductions to each of our speakers. So our first speaker today um, in this session is Tapio Schneider. He is a professor of environmental science and engineering at Caltech and a senior research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His research focuses on many things, including climate dynamics of Earth and other planets, turbulence um, in both the atmosphere and ocean, cloud dynamics, and as we will likely hear about today, climate modeling. So that, Tapio, go ahead and I think share your screen. Yeah, thanks, Libby, and thanks for having me. Um, let's see. So I hope you can see the screen. Looks great. Thank you. 
Okay. Yes, I do want to talk about uncertainties in climate modeling. Uh, I was asked to talk about. Um, okay, here we go. As you know, Earth has warmed 1.2 degrees since the uh, Industrial Revolution and climate is continuing to warm. We will most likely have to live in a world at least about two degrees warmer um, in the coming decades. And because almost all climate impacts that you look at scale with the global mean temperature change, global mean temperature change is actually a useful metric to ask questions about climate change. Here's just one example from a paper by Sonia Senevi-Ratna that shows um, the percentage change in heavy rainfall in the uh, South Asian monsoon region. And you see that percentage change scales with the global mean warming. Um, one consequence is that mitigation remains critical. It remains critical to reduce the global mean warming as much as we can. But the corollary is adaptation will be unavoidable. In fact, we already see climate impacts right now for example, the probability of the devastating rainfall associated with Hurricane Harvey, of that rainfall occurring, has been estimated to have been roughly tripled by climate change in the past few decades. So climate change is already affecting risks in this case of extreme rainfall events as one example. And while mitigation remains essential, adaptation is unavoidable. And adaptation also means we need to know what to adapt to. And here's a bit the rub. Here's this one example. This is global mean temperature change as a function of time into the future for two scenarios um, from the IPCC report. It's one of lower emission scenario, higher emission scenario. And if you just focus your attention on the two degrees line, let's take this as an arbitrary threshold and ask the question, when will we cross that threshold? Now there's some climate models that say we have already crossed that threshold. Well, that's obviously wrong. And there are other models that say, even under a high emission scenario, it will be until the 2060s, 70s before we cross that threshold. And that huge span in predictions means that these predictions are not fit for purpose for adaptation planning for the engineering purposes that we have heard about before. So climate models are good for realizing that we need to mitigate what we can in global warming they're not good enough for a lot of adaptation decisions. For some, they may be, but for a lot of engineering decisions, like the bridges we heard about, they're, they're not good enough. Um, the various sources of uncertainty, as I think is quite well known. Here's, here's some graphs from a paper by uh, Flavio Lehner et al. from the ENCA group, from the large ensemble. What is shown on the left is the global decadal mean temperature change relative to some baseline. In a few emission scenarios and the thinner lines for each emission scenario are just model simulations um, run for different initial conditions from different modeling centers and the like. And the right graph is trying to break down the uncertainty in the predictions here into three factors. One is internal variability, that's uncertainty in the initial condition. Um, one is scenario uncertainty, so that's an uncertainty in what we will do in emission scenarios. And the third is model uncertainty. So these are model errors. And you see that for this specific question, what is the decadal mean temperature? Internal variability is a large factor um, in the immediate future. It decreases in relative importance relative to model error, which is the dominant source of uncertainties for the next few decades. And as you go further out towards centennial time scales, the scenario uncertainty becomes dominant. Now, Sometimes these graphs are interpreted as saying, well, there is a large contribution from internal variability, and obviously that's not reducible by any improvement in climate modeling. Um, it's one perspective on what internal variability does is it adds a source of uncertainty. It, it is a nuisance. If you want to say how much global mean temperatures will change. So here's, here's one example from... Uh, from models that only differ by very small amounts in their atmospheric initial condition and produce quite divergent statistics in the global mean temperature. Um, that's internal variability. It, from this perspective, it's a source of uncertainty, but perhaps a more useful perspective for what we're talking about here is that 
It's a contributor to risk. We've already heard that. So if you ask a different question, what's the probability of exceeding a given threshold of temperature or precipitation or whatever it may be, then of course, internal variability contributes to that probability of exceeding the threshold. If it's large, then you're more likely to exceed it by natural causes alone. But it's not an uncertainty in that sense. It's just a contributor to risk. And perhaps that's the more valuable way of looking at it for, for the focus of um, this discussion today. So internal variability is something we have to live with, but we'll have to quantify it. It contributes to risk and risk needs to be quantified. Then there's model error that far dominates. What can we do about that? There is some progress to be made by increasing the resolution of climate models. Here's some example from uh, Tom Delberth at GFDL. Uh, the top plot shows the precipitation frequency, the probability density function of precipitation frequency. For blue is observations, and then there are um, various ensembles of model simulations, relatively coarse from CESM, NCAR, and black dot, dots, and then to um, high resolution simulations, expare high. And you see that the high resolution model captures the frequency distribution of precipitation events more reliably. However, resolution is not going to solve all problems here. If you look at high resolution simulations of mean precipitation at the bottom panel, this is from ECMWF, comparing about 10 with about one kilometer resolution simulations, you see that even at one kilometer resolution, it's the blue line relative to observations in black, the large biases in the distribution of precipitation. So just higher resolution will give you better resolution of the frequency of say extreme precipitation events, but you might still get it completely wrong where the rain falls. So resolution is not a solution in itself. So what do we do? Um, there are various, I think, priorities that flow from just looking at the sources of uncertainty and, and what you can do about it. Number one is we should produce large ensembles at the highest resolution we can. And we need this both to quantify internal variability, and as I'll argue in just a minute, also for calibration and uncertainty quantification of the small scale processes that are behind the model errors. Um, we need to reduce and quantify model errors and they can be reduced and they can be quantified. I will say a bit more about how I think this can be done in a minute. Suffice it to say here that we need to accelerate progress in modeling small scale processes. And I think one path to accelerate progress here is using data much more extensively than we have. And in the end, you want to have models that diverse groups of users can use to explore uncertainties broadly, to samples broadly from all sources of uncertainties. That includes initial condition uncertainties, includes sampling from model errors that need to be quantified. Once you have quantified them, you can sample from them. That includes structural model errors, and you need to explore scenario uncertainties in the same way. It means that you need climate models that you can run relatively efficiently. The PCAST report was already mentioned. It addresses two points. Um, it, it was a working group on extreme weather risk and climate and climate change on which I was, on which I served for the past year. There were a number of recommendations coming out of it. For our discussion here, I think there are two sets of recommendations that are crucial. Um, what we realized in, in the working group is that we are ready to produce large ensembles at resolutions in the 10 kilometer range or so. Um, various US climate modeling centers can do this now. And the recommendation of this report is let's produce large ensembles, you know, order 100 ensemble members at the finest resolution we can to at least quantify risks from internal variability. That alone is not sufficient. The, the data so produced need to become useful and accessible. So one extensive set of recommendations deals with how to make the data more accessible, um, building APIs, user portals, that allow access to the data and broader experimentation with the data to look at things like compound risks that were already mentioned. There's a second set of recommendations that deals with the downstream issue that was, I think, the topic of, of the first session today, offline hazard models. Um, once you have ensembles of climate simulations, you can use them to anchor offline models for specific for specific hazards, wind storms, storm surges, hurricanes, and the like. And that can be built on top of 
the ensemble of climate simulations. What this will give you is quantification of risks due to internal variability under climate change scenarios. The scenario is not very important for the next few decades, if that's the focus, the model errors dominate there. If you have a few modeling centers doing that, you get some loose quantification of model error, but not a very rigorous quantification of model errors because you'll end up only having a few models and not the rigorous quantification of the model errors. And that's what came out of, out of that working group. There's it's a host of other recommendations on making data more accessible, for example, for hazard models and a climate change adaptation plan um, that I won't talk about now. There's one big piece that's not addressed in the PCAS report, and I think that's that would be a good topic for BAS to take tag on and it's not addressed really globally, and that's the following. Suppose the PCAS recommendations are implemented. You'll get around 300 um, ensemble members, perhaps three institutions, 100 members, something that order of magnitude. What you would want to save from that is not everything, but order 100 petabyte of data you really want to keep. And 100 petabyte is not the data set you can download. So downloading data for processing is not feasible. You need to analyze the data where they are. And the challenge here is that we have no viable model currently for storing the data, making them accessible and useful. Uh, in the commercial cloud, the storing those data would cost about a million dollars per month. It's really expensive. And we have in the government no clear model for how to provide the data in such a way that they can be analyzed where they are because that's what needs to happen. I think that's that's an important topic that has no solution yet and has not perhaps seen the discussion I think it deserves. Ultimately, you'd like to make all data accessible and useful through one API. And all data here includes observations as, as well. We get 50 terabyte from daily from NASA alone. Ideally, they would be co-located with the simulation output, then you can do things like downscaling, bias correction of models, and it would be nice to have a model for doing that. Um, I want to talk a few minutes about model error. I think it can they can be reduced. They are dominating on timescales of 20 to 40 years or so. That I think is for adaptation decisions, the, the key time scale. And making data accessible, that's sort of filling a a second gap in this value chain that extends from data to adaptation tools. And all the diagrams that I've seen before, I think data were kind of missing, this concentric and all, all the versions we have seen. I think data are crucial. We have a lot of data and we need to use it. So building APIs, portals, deals with a second gap in this value chain that right now is, is not built out, not integrated. But I think reducing model errors needs to come through filling this first gap in a value chain between models and data. The big problem in, in climate modeling are small scale processes, for example, clouds. They have scales for clouds, the dynamical scales are 110 meters or so. They're microphysical scales at nanometers, but the model resolution is, well, maybe going toward 10, 10 kilometer resolution, but it's a far cry from what we need to actually resolve the, these uncertain processes that lead to large scale biases like the large scale biases and precipitation distributions that I showed you before. I think data here are an important part of the solution of how to make progress. Right now, the models we use for small scale processes are not extensively data informed, but they can be. Two minutes. How many minutes you said? Two minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, so when you use data in a climate modeling context, you have a few special challenges. We need to predict the climate none of us has seen. So you need to generalize out of a sample. You want people to trust models. We've heard that earlier today, which means models need to be interpretable. It can't just be a black box that produces something that we don't know where it comes from, that we can't easily validate. And uncertainty quantification is essential, which means risk assessment is essential. Um, how do you do that? Deep learning alone, I think, is not the way forward, but it helps. The success of deep learning rests on overparameterization on models with many parameters. It leads to very expressive models, but makes generalizability, interpretability, and UQ challenging. Science, as we have done it for the last 400 years, rests on parametric sparsity, reductionist science. Newton's law would be the paradigmatic example. It's a one-parameter law that describes how apples fall from trees and planets over its stars but clearly it reaches its limits in complex systems like the Earth system. So I think the way forward is to combine the best of both worlds. And in the Klima project, we are doing that. We are building an Earth system model that's process-based, but where parentizations are 
to a large extent new and built from the outset so that they can learn effectively from data, but are physics-based, chemistry-based, biology-based. We harnessing diverse data, simulated and observed data for calibration and uncertainty quantification, focusing on climate statistics like the seasonal cycle in this process, and use computing power where we can, for example, to generate high resolution simulations. You can, it's not the time to go through the technical details, but suffice it to say in this process, you can also learn about structural errors in the models that likewise need to be quantified, not just parametric errors. The errors that Klaus talked about. Um, let me just leave a few key points here. I think internal variability contributes to risks. We quantify it by having large ensembles. Large ensembles, it turns out, is also what's needed for calibration of models with data. Um, we have tools now, AI tools, to do this fast enough that it's becoming a doable proposition to learn automatically for a whole climate model, for a whole Earth system model from data. And in the end, we need models that allow us to explore possible climate outcomes as broadly as possible by sampling from internal variability, initial conditions, from model error, both parametric and structural, and scenario uncertainties. And once you have ensembles like that, that come with attached probabilities, which with the tools I didn't have the time to introduce, you can do then you can use that to anchor downstream hazard models, propagate uncertainties through the chain, all the way to data products that can actually inform engineering decisions, for example. Thank you. Thank you, Tapio. Okay, questions? Effie, I see a real hand, go for it. Yeah, thank you, Tapio. The, the that is exceptional. Um, I really liked it. One issue that I want to bring up, you mentioned machine learning and AI is not the solution, yet it can guide us. One example I would like to bring is recently we tried a deep neural network, but instead of the standard cost functions, root mean square error, et cetera, we taught it how to learn things that we cared about. For example, space-time wavelet spectrum. So we know what variability it misses at what scale and we tell it not to miss it so forth uh so space-time structure um do you think or are you thinking along these directions because again you you said it right observations we have too many and we don't use them as much to to learn structural error yeah yeah i think there's a lot we can do with design of loss functions designing them so that you focus on what matters. What you mentioned, basically, spectra is one one possibility. You can design loss functions, say with exponential weighting that emphasize extremes, if that is what you're interested in. And maybe the one thing I want to say about loss functions in in the business of climate prediction, we want to predict statistics of the system, and exceedances of our thresholds of precipitation, mean temperatures, seasonal cycle of temperature, Arctic sea ice, and so on. And to me, the corollary to that is the loss functions should contain those statistics. That changes the learning problem quite a bit um, because statistics you accumulate in time. And that makes the loss function evaluation expensive. You need to run a model for quite some time to evaluate it. And it changes the learning problem because it becomes more of an inverse problem than say supervised learning problem. And it changes the algorithms you would need to use. And But we have tools to do that. Um, to do that well, essentially build loss functions that focus on what matters, climate statistics, and learn about things, small scale processes like entrainment and clouds. You can learn from those large scale statistics. Thank you. Other questions? If not, I have one. Tapio, um, just going off of, I know we'll, during the panel, we'll talk more about this, but in terms of the guiding questions, since you're actively in, you know, developing models here, and you've talked through sort of your guys' process. Do you have any examples of how you are or could bring in the decision-making needs? Because we heard earlier today more of flipping the script, if you will, and going in the other direction. And I'm curious, more than just people need to know if it's going to rain, so let's make sure we, sure we do precipitation well. I'm wondering if there are ways that you, you could envision people bringing that into the process or you're doing already. Yeah, we are doing some of that uh, with people in the building technology sector, for example, who you know, want to build buildings that are comfortable 20, 30 years from now with a 
people designing data centers and um, thermal requirements for them. I would say I see my, and I think we, we may do more of it later, but but I see my primary job right now, or and perhaps for the climate modeling community as a whole, as building better climate models that actually quantify uncertainties and making samples from these models easily accessible through some API that then you can plug in downstream hazard models and those you really want to co-develop with ultimate stakeholders. And this will be a whole ecosystem of them because very different requirements for different stakeholders. But what they all need at the back end is climate predictions or projections with quantified uncertainties. Great, thank you. Steven? Yeah, I have a question from the um, public input. Um, you mentioned that uh, large ensembles at highest feasible resolution. And um, just can you talk about the trade off between the ensemble size and resolution when you're looking at modeling? And is there a maximum useful ensemble size? Uh, that's an important and good question. Um, with no easy answer. I mean, if you talk with people in the reinsurance industry who want to assess hurricane risks, they want ensembles of 20 to 30,000 members, right? And now that's not what we are going to produce with a climate model. Um, so, I mean, there's an obvious trade-off. You know, resolution is, compute cost scales cubically in resolution, right? So that's one important thing to realize. So going from one to 10 kilometers, it's a factor of thousand in compute. So you can do one ensemble member one kilometer or a thousand at 10 kilometers. So the evidence so far to me is then do a thousand at 10 kilometers if that's the computational resources you have available because the improvement for 10 to one kilometers is, is not that large yet. But say 100 versus 10 kilometers, would you now want to go to you know, a million versus thousand, 100 versus 10 kilometers? But there is sizable improvement going from 100 to 10 kilometers and that at 10 kilometers you actually resolve tropical cyclone frequencies reasonably well and that clearly has value. I think what will end up happening in this space is that we'll produce moderate size ensembles, size 100, and use the wonderful generative models that AI is providing us to produce much larger ensembles. Um, perhaps focus on specific impacts, perhaps focus on specific variables, but I think it's a great space for generative AI to fill in what we can't do with brute force computing. Awesome, thank you, Tapio. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. So our next speaker, um, and Isla, go ahead and get up your things, uh, share your screen. Um, so our next speaker is Isla Simpson. She is a scientist three in the Climate and Global Dynamics Division at NCAR. Her research focuses and works to understand dynamical mechanisms involved in the variability and change of the large scale atmospheric circulation and its impacts on regional climate and hydroclimate using a hierarchy of modeling approaches. So with that, Isla, um, take it away. Okay, thanks. The slides look good? Yes, everything looks good and we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in this. So there might be some overlap here between uh, mine and, and Tapio's views. So uh, first of all, I think our, our global projections are really the starting point for any anything that um, in terms of decision making, you know, we may not be able to tell everything we need to know on the small scale from these global models, but we need to know how the global circulation and moisture transports and temperatures are going to change to then kind of input to other techniques which might be able to provide the necessary information on the smaller scale. So here I'm really focusing on our global earth system models. And as Tapio already went through, we kind of have three primary sources of uncertainty. We have internal variability, which is just the natural variability in the system and it's irreducible. It's going to be there in the one version of the real world that we view, but we can quantify how important that is and we can quantify the range of outcomes that could arise as a result from it. Then we have the scenario uncertainty, which is how are four things like greenhouse gases and aerosols going to evolve. And then there's the model response uncertainty. So how does a model respond to an external forcing that it's given? And I just want to note that kind of as we move towards fully interactive carbon cycle models that are emissions driven as opposed to concentration driven, I guess these, these uncertainties would kind of become a bit more connected because the models would be starting to determine how much carbon is kind of taken up 
uh, by the land and the ocean and things. So I just wanted to note that. But here I'm not really going to discuss the scenario uncertainty and really focus on the internal variability and the model response uncertainty. So um, I further want to kind of divide the model response uncertainty up into two parts. One that's intermodal spread that we're aware of, that we can try to understand and reduce. And then the other is some potential issues that might be lurking that might be making all of our models wrong. And so uh, this first guiding question that we have is which sources of uncertainty are most important? And I think that's definitely going to depend on the question that you're asking, what variable you're looking at and what location you're looking at. Um, so here I just want to go through one example and demonstrate to you a case where I think all of these uh, sources of uncertainty are going to be important, and that's the case of North American hydroclimate projections. So I'm going to start with internal variability. And here I'm just showing you precipitation projections uh, in the 100-member CSM2 large ensemble for 2030 to 2050 in the wintertime. And so this is the average over those 100 members. Um, you get some wetting in the west, some wetting in the east, a bit less of a change in the south. So this is our forced response in the model. But we can ask, you know, using this 100 member large ensemble, what are the range of futures that we actually could potentially experience? So if we just focus on a region like the southwest, you know, we can pick out the ensemble member that has the wettest projection, uh, and then the ensemble member that has the driest projection. And these ensemble members are just differing as a result of different realizations of internal variability. And so what this tells us is that internal variability really can be huge. And as Tapio advocated for, we need large ensembles with a realistic representation of the internal variability to be able to characterize this and be able to know what are the range of futures that we might be needing to um, adapt to. So I want to show you an example of where there ha we have intermodal spread that we're aware of that we could try and understand and reduce. And we're going to stick here with uh, precipitation projections over the U.S., but I'm moving to the summer now. Um, and I'm going to show you results from 10 large ensembles that have at least 20 members each. Uh, and we'll focus in on the four corners states here. So just looking at average precipitation projections over the four corners. And uh, I'll show you results here. Um, as a function of global warming level, like Tapio also showed, um, to kind of put the models on more of an equal footing in terms of how much the planet has warmed. And all you see here at the beginning is this gray shaded range just to orient you. And this is a range of uncertainties in 20 year averages that we could have just from internal variability alone. So you can get some perspective on how big the model differences are in their forced projections. And here I'm showing you in the colors the ensemble mean for each of these 10 models. So this is the forced response. This is how the models are responding to greenhouse gases. And you can see that they are all over the place. Um, and the range of uncertainty is large. You know, the models at the opposite end of the scale are exhibiting forced responses that are totally outside of anything we would expect as a result of internal variability alone. And then, of course, on top of this, this model response uncertainty, we have internal variability. And so here I'm just showing the individual members for these two most extreme models. And then that expands your uncertainty range out even more. So for our climate model projections in this Four Corners region, we have really a big uncertainty in summertime precipitation projections. And a large part of that uncertainty is really coming from the fact that the models are all doing different things in their response to external forcings. And so this is the kind of uncertainty that we can try and understand and reduce. So we need to understand why are the models doing different things? And then through that understanding, figure out which ones we think we trust the most. And so there are approaches like emergent constraints where you try and relate a model's projected change to some aspect of the present day climate that you can observe and then come up with kind of a more informed uh, view of which models you think are more correct. But now I wanna talk about potential issues that might be making all models wrong. And I think this is something that we really not need to uh, be more and more concerned about because we're really starting to experience climate change in the real world. And so we're starting to see the real world evolve and we're starting to realize that there are some problems in our models. And there are a few problems that I'm, I'm concerned about. I'm only going to go through one of them here, but I'll mention a couple of them at the end. 
And I'm going to talk about the representation of sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific. So first of all, a reason why we care about what the tropical Pacific is doing, this is analysis from another paper by Flavio Lehner, uh, which is looking at trends in precipitation over the um, US Southwest. And so in observations, we've had a drying trend over the last few decades. If you look at couple model ensemble mean projections here, you don't really see much of a signal. Uh, but if you give that same model, the observed time evolution of sea surface temperatures, you get the drying. So the, the evolution of the sea surface temperatures has played an important role in giving rise to this drying um, over the Southwest. And so this is what our trends in sea surface temperatures over the last four decades have looked like, a slightly different period, but it doesn't really matter. But what you see here is that we've had this relative cooling in the Eastern tropical Pacific and also in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and this has played an important role, I think, in this drying trend in the Southwest. And it's also kind of at odds with what our models suggest is the uh, forced response to greenhouse gases. So if you take the average overall models, they suggest actually we should have had a relative warming in the Eastern tropical Pacific. But of course, our real world is just one realization. Their internal variability could be playing a role here. But I think we're starting to realize that there's a chance that um, that might not be the, only, the whole thing that's going on because the observed trends really lie at the edge of our model distribution. So here's a couple of papers recently. Both of them are looking at a metric of the difference in sea surface temperatures between the west and the east. This one is comparing observed trends in the lines here with the large ensembles. And this one is comparing all of the CMIP6 members in blue with various um, observation trends here. And both of these studies show that the kind of observed signal is it does lie within the model distribution, but it's lying very much at the edge of the model distribution. So we have kind of a dilemma here. Is what we've seen in the real world just a very unlikely occurrence of natural variability? Or do we have something wrong in our models, whether that be the forced climate change signal or internal variability? And I think that's still somewhat of an open question, but I think there's more and more evidence that we may have something wrong here. And one thing I wanna emphasize just like Tapio did is that we really need large ensembles to be able to see this. We, we need many members to know where is the real world sitting uh, in terms of the probability of occurrence if we take our models um, as being the truth. So uh, there've been a couple of arguments made for what might be going wrong in models. One is focused on the tropics and that models might be getting this ocean dynamical thermostat mechanism wrong. Um, but the other is uh, linked to this cooling in the Southern Ocean and that maybe models are not getting this cooling in the Southern Ocean and this signal is kind of being transmitted into the low latitudes. And indeed, um, if you compare the Southern Ocean trends in models, which all tend to show a warming, uh, the observed slight cooling in the Southern Ocean lies at the very edge of the model distribution. So we still have a lot of open questions here, but I wanna show you some uh, new results with some high resolution simulations with CESM that I think are indicating that we very much do have a problem or something incorrect in our low resolution models. So our standard resolution models are typically about one degree. Uh, and the simulations I'll show you here are using a quarter degree in the atmosphere and a 10th degree in the ocean. And this is the difference between observations and models that we've seen over the historical record expressed as a, a standard deviation of the model distribution. And so here are some results from these different model resolutions. And these are initialized predictions. So they're not the same thing as free running climate models. They're initialized and from observation based states and run for five years. And what you're seeing here is the anomaly correlation coefficient between the model predictions and observations. And you see at the low resolution, you've got negative skill here in the Eastern tropical Pacific and in the Southern Ocean. And the higher resolution that moves to being positive skill. And if we take the difference between those high and low resolution models uh, in their skill, you can see that this pattern here very closely resembles this pattern of discrepancy that we have between 
models and observations in the historical trends. So I don't want to make any firm conclusions here, but I think there's a lot more to figure out. And there's a chance that as we move towards higher and higher resolution, we might start to see our forest climate change signal um, really deviating from the lower resolution models. And then we have the question, well, what would it take, to, or what would it what would it look like if we did all of our future projections with these kind of um, moderately higher resolution models? So hopefully I've convinced you that each of these sources of uncertainty um, have the potential to matter. And so the other guiding question is what are the low hanging fruits? And I'm gonna kind of avoid answering that question because I don't think we should be going for the low hanging fruits. I think we should be going after the biggest most impactful problems that we think we have. And I think this example of tropical Pacific trends is one of them. And there are other examples though that I'd be happy to talk about in the discussion like the signal to noise paradox in North Atlantic predictions. I think we have issues in representing land atmosphere coupling and humidity trends. And I'm sure there are many more. Um, our un uncertainties due to internal variability will never be reduced, but we need to continue to quantify them with models that represent internal variability accurately. The uncertainties due to model response differences are challenging to reduce, but that should be something we should be able to do. We should be able to understand why models do different things and then figure out which ones we think are more correct. So how do we go about doing this? Yep, okay. Um, we there's always this trade-off between resolution and complexity and ensemble size if you have limited computational resources and uh, much like tapio i think we need to maintain the ability to have large enough ensembles we need to be able to characterize the systems we're looking at and to be able to determine whether we have discrepancies from observations when you account for internal variability but we need to kind of move up this complexity and resolution axis enough to get the answers right and figure out what does it take to um, improve our projections and include those in our models while still retaining the ability to have large enough ensembles. And of course, we need to be keeping our eye on the real world because we're at the point now where we can start to see discrepancies in the between observed and predicted signals uh, in the observational record. So just one uh, final slide about the final question, how might decision-making needs inform the development and use of climate models? I think the decision-making needs will inform how uh, global models are translated into actionable information. For example, what spatial and temporal scales are needed, what projection timelines are needed, and what is the most useful information? Do people wanna know the worst case scenario that they need to adapt to or the most likely outcome and then I think the decision-making needs should also inform the targets for improvements in model development. What are the uncertainties that we currently cannot handle when trying to make decisions? You know, if the four corners decision makers are totally fine with that range of uncertainty and precipitation, then maybe that that's not the focus. But if there's if it really matters a lot to narrow down this range of precipitation projections, then that's what we need to do. So I'm probably out of time. Um, I will, I guess, maybe just leave my conclusions up there uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Isla. Um, and we have, I have a hand, Linda, go for it. Um, thanks. That was really uh, very, oh, sorry. <laughs> that, thanks. That was really very, uh, very useful presentation. Uh, and I just want to compliment you on actually <laughs> focusing on what we were trying to uh, accomplish here. Um, and that's not, yeah, that's really important. Anyway, so um, your issue about the the resolution of the models, um, there are all those simulations from high-res MIP from CMIP six, some of which were at about 25 kilometers. Um, so I wonder, I, I'm not really familiar with the results of the high-res MIP. I wonder if any of those also give um, different responses for the, the South Pacific that you were describing or South yeah. Atlantic. Yeah, it's a good question. I was wondering that as I was getting these slides together. Um, 
I, I don't know. Uh, there, there, Rob Wells may have looked at that in his paper at the high-res MIP simulations, and I don't mm -hmm. recall the answer. I guess one thing to say is that I, I don't know that high resolution is everything because yeah. um, sure. there are, you know, I guess with CSM, even at, at low resolution, there were um, so there was some work done with Southern Ocean pacemakers where you just kind of force the Southern Ocean to have that cooling trend. And in CSM1, that did not produce a signal in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, while in CSM2, it seems to. There's a new paper coming out by Sarah Kang about that. So I, it seems to be related to differences in the representation of the Clyde feedback. So um, I... I think it's conceivable that other higher resolution models might not get it if they have different other aspects of their simulation that are different, like the cloud feedbacks. But I, I don't know offhand whether anyone has looked at the high res MIP, uh, simulations in this context. And these are very okay. new results with CSM. So I think there's still a lot to be done to figure out, you know, is it getting it right for the right reasons and what the mechanisms are. Great, thanks. All right, John, go for it. Thanks. I, I had kind of a similar question, I think, in the end, Isla. Um, if it is resolution, doesn't the resolution dependence still have to be explained? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think what we really need to do is figure out, is it ocean or atmosphere resolution or both? I mean, it, if, if what you need to get this right is to have a one-tenth degree ocean and you can happily have a one degree atmosphere on top of that, then I think that would be good guidance for the next generation of models, right? It's, it's, it would not be nearly as expensive as having the quarter degree atmosphere, but there's the, a chance that we're kind of wasting our time with one degree ocean models. Um, but it, it very much still needs to be understood and maybe there's a way to parameterize the relevant processes in the lower resolution models to, um, yeah, it needs to be understood and we need to figure out what is the minimum thing we need to do in models to get this right and are we confident that they are more right. Other questions? Okay, if not, this is my turn. Um, so Isla, I was interested in your comment about how you split uncertainties and one of the splits was sort of uncertain differences between models, I think is how you phrased it and that we can, we can really understand that. And I guess my question is, where do you see the balance between um, trying to understand the differences across the models we have versus trying to move forward, if you will, and just build better ones? Does that make sense? Presumably there's a balance there because we don't want to spend all the time on the models we have, but we don't want to necessarily just say, well, this one was last year's and, and move on, right? Yeah, I I mean, I, I think the way we should be doing it is building off of the ones we have and incrementally seeing, you know, how do Im improvements um, change things and understanding that. I guess I'm a little nervous about this kind of move towards digital twins and like just whole new models that are a totally different resolution and not kind of seeing you know, how, what is the path to getting there? What, like, okay, you could have a four kilometer model that maybe does something better, but would you also get that with a 25 kilometer model? I think I'm, I think, I feel like we need to incrementally be building on the models that we have. And I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the right balance is, but I think when we see a see something in the real world that we know we're getting totally wrong, I think we need to get that right or else we don't trust any of the models. Great, okay, thank you, Isla. And I think we're just on time to move on to our last speaker of this session. All right, so go ahead and, and Balaji, you can start pulling things up. So uh, as an introduction, V. Balaji is a distinguished fellow at Smith Futures and was previously head of the Modeling Systems Division at NOAA's um, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. He's an expert in climate modeling and currently works to build new programs in climate and computational sciences. So with that, go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Libby. So can you see my screen? We can see and hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, um, you will probably hear some of the similar concerns, uh, preoccupations that have been raised by Tapio and uh, Isla. 
I hope to, I'll say sufficiently different things so we can make the conversation interesting, but there'll be some overlaps and I think some points of disagreement. I will state some opinions, uh, which um, hopefully make the session interesting. Um, the opinions, let me just start by saying, do not uh, necessarily belong to either of the affiliations I've listed here. One is Schmidt Futures, where I currently work, and one is uh, IPSL in France. So uh, you will see even some of the same figures sometimes showing up here, but let's just talk about the fact, I mean, I'll, I'll go through some of uh, the work. So we talked a lot about how people downstream are going to use our models. We have a scalability challenge in the sense that the number of people actually producing climate models, working on climate models is quite small compared to the number of people shown in this figure here from the EPA who want to use our results. So there is what I call a say, there's a there's this, this challenge with scalability of actually making our models run bigger, faster, whatever it may be, but there's also this scientific scalability challenge. And the second thing is that we need to con communicate uncertainty very well across this chain. So this is another old system, uh, old uh, figure from a paper by Moss et al. in 2010, which showed the whole sequence of modeling that takes place when you actually try to go towards uh, actionable information. So going from pure science towards actionable information. So this is a whole model chain and there is a social challenge, there's a scientific challenge, there's a semantic challenge. We don't often speak the same language. And of course there is a software challenge. How are we going to share data across and how, how do we actually couple models if we're going to couple them? Couple models tend to, uh, We'll get to the problem of calibration and so forth, which has already been mentioned. But once you get into this space where models are talking and feeding back on each other, we have a lot of problems with how this thing is going to work. So we have to think very carefully. And one of the things I think, one of the main things I want to say here in the context of this meeting is uh, we need to communicate what we know, what we have calibrated, what we don't know, what is the uncertainty. All these things need to be communicated very carefully across this entire model chain. Now, this paper has been shown before, and we've discussed these scenarios. So uh, these three modes of uncertainty, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine, and she recently, after a recent presentation where I showed the same figure, and she said that Hawkins and Sutton had a nickel for each time this figure was shown somewhere. They would be sitting on fortunes right now. But it's kind of an important thing again. So we've talked about these three kinds of uncertainty, the internal variability or chaotic uncertainty. There's the scenario uncertainty, which is shown in green here. And there is the structural or epistemic uncertainty, which is our imperfect understanding of how the world works. One thing to note here is that uh, one point that was uh, has been, uh, the word that has been used many, many times here is prediction. Uh, Linda showed a slide uh, at the top of the session, uh, and she was not endorsing the slide, so I'm not hold, you know, holding her to task for it, but the, she showed a slide where there was a concentric diagram, and the, right there in the middle in the bullseye was a big circle that said predictions. The implication is that if we had better predictions of the Earth system, somehow we would get towards right answers. I'm going to argue here that predictions are actually uh, overrated compared to the importance of counterfactuals. We need to know to know what what many things that might happen if we did something or we did not do something, which none of this can be verified in the real world. So that is kind of important to keep in mind. Decision making is all about counterfactuals. What happens if we do something and what happens if we don't do something? Uh, a second point I want to make with this figure, the same figure, is that uh, it's what's shown here is a lead time of 100 years. And we've talked often about in the already in the session about the trade-offs between resolution, complexity, and the size of an ensemble, number of instances. I want to also uh, emphasize the fact that the simulation duration is also important. For many things we want to know, particularly if you want to know about what's happening to the carbon, what's happening to the heat stored in the ocean. Uh, if we go on a decarbonization trajectory, what is going to happen? How are those two, uh, the heat, ocean heat uptake and ocean carbon uptake, how are they going to react? All of these require fairly long simulations. So a fourth constraint that is placed on models in how, how you use computing for modeling is also about simulation duration. So a baseline requirement I would state just based on this figure is that you need to be able to run, if you have something that you're calling a model, you need to be able to run 100 simulations of 100 simulated years each. If you can't do that, 100 days is a kind of arbitrary thing I put there, which is you can think of as perhaps a scientist's attention span. If you you can't start running a model and get a result in three or four months, then you, you probably moved on to something else. But just keep the first two hundreds in mind. You need to run hundreds at least. We've already been through this in the last two presentations. And they need to be of a certain duration as well. 
And one of the challenges we are facing, uh, this again, uh, if uh, people have heard me talk, I, I show this slide fairly often. Computers are getting bigger, but they're not getting faster. So this is on a logarithmic scale is showing how CMOS technology, the basically uh, uh, circuits etched in silicon, how they've evolved over the last several decades. And we know this as Moore's law that the number of transistors doubles every 18 months or so. But the important figure here is the green curve, which is the frequency shown in megahertz, which is the actual speed of an arithmetic operation. It, it kind of uh, stopped, tapped out, topped out at around a gigahertz, around 10 to the three megahertz in this graph. That means like uh, you can do an operation in about a nanosecond that has not got faster in about a decade. So what this means is that you can do weak scaling problems. You can do bigger problems in the same amount of time. So that means that could mean a higher resolution model or a more complex model. You cannot do strong scaling. That is, uh, if you wait another five years, the problem that you're solving today at this, that resolution with that num that many variables will not run any faster. It will run at the same speed. And this has been shown. So this is from one of uh, uh, Tapio's uh, papers. It shows this the same kind of uh, leveling off that you see in the green curve, you see in the next curve as well. Resolutions of the models haven't really kept pace with the what you might assume if you're following Moore's law, which is the blue curve where they might go. So this is showing for different classes of complexity of models, just atmospheric GCMs or atmosphere ocean GCMs or earth system models that include a biosphere. In all of these, the resolution somehow stays well below where you might expect. So at GFTL, for example, where I work, from the Manabe and Bryan paper, which is the first coupled model from 50 years ago, 1969, to the model we submitted to CMIP-6, which is uh, Isaac Held et al. 19, in 2019, so 50 years, the model uh, resolution increased by 10x. It did not increase by anything like uh, the, the orders of magnitude you might expect if you're simply following the computing curve. What can these new computers do? <clears throat> they can do a certain class of problem very well, dense linear algebra. So if you're computing, for example, the, uh, just take a correlation problem, you have a certain set of inputs shown in red and uh, uh, outputs shown in blue, and you're computing the relationship between the inputs and the outputs. So the more you increase, if you use a, if you can do simply a regression between those two variables, um, so the number of arithmetic operations can be kind of graphically seen here as the number of black lines. If you use one layer neural network or if you use a deep neural network, you can see the density of arithmetic keeps going up, but the number of inputs and outputs stays the same. So because of this, you can do much denser problems and that these new chips uh, do extremely well. So this is one reason why a lot of work is going into turning every problem to look like a deep learning problem. And one thing people have done with that is to do perfect emulation of even chaotic systems. So this is a famous paper from around a few years ago, five years ago, model free, the title says it very clearly, model free prediction of chaotic systems. So you take a classic uh, chaotic system called the Kuromatos-Sivashinsky system. Uh, you learn it uh, using a technique called a recurrent neural network. And then the third panel here shows the difference between these two. And you, show, you see that a, a chaotic system has been emulated more or less perfectly. Uh, the problem here is that it's, it's just simulating it for a given value of uh, some of the free parameters in the model. If you change them, it doesn't know what to do at all because it's just a perfect emulation. Climate is a non-stationary problem. There have been several papers written about it showing that uh, if you train on present day climate and try to predict future climate, uh, you, you make errors. But if you can train on future climates as well, then you do a very good job. How do you do that? You actually don't train on real world observations because you don't have observations of the future, but you train on models that have been run into the future and you try to emulate those. So, one way to look at that is to use um, this uh, phrase that I use called Charney's Ladder. So Charney, uh, Jules Charney, one of the founders of our field, when he built actually the very first model of, of all, uh, 1950 on the ENIAC. And it was like a two layer or three layer model, depending on how you're counting. It's a highly simple model compared to today. And he then predicted that as we get bigger and bigger computers, you could increase complexity. And he called it climbing the ladder. So what you can do is that you can run. So this is the kind of thing that we've been talking about. You can run very high simulations. You can't run them for very long, but you can run some high resolution simulations, extremely high resolution simulations if need be, what we call LES models or large edge simulation models, and you can learn from them. And that, that, that gives you some confidence. If you learn them for various kinds of regimes, some of which might be representative of warmer climates than today. And if you learn all their behaviors, you might be able to do something, but simply learning 
what's going on in the observations is not good enough. So how do we do this learning? So there's several steps to it. So you can, uh, there's a certain number of parameters, let's say that you're, that you're using to parameterize high resolution processes in your model. So you have to do three things. You have to find uh, good values of those parameters or at least eliminate bad values of those parameters and you must quantify the uncertainty. So the, these are the three things you must do. Running the forward model is very expensive. That's your GCM. So you want to do that as few times as possible. So while using a very few forward model runs, explore all of the parameter space. There's two kinds of uncertainty that we want to explore here, as we've talked about. There's parameter, parametric uncertainty and there's structural uncertainty. You want to at least diagnose that your model is wrong. So you want to be able to do that. There is a two-stage process in which we do this. So the model is composed of many coupled processes. You try to tune or calibrate each one of those. And then after that, you apply some global constraints to the coupled system. This is a tricky uh, process as we've demonstrated in a recent paper I wrote with a, a postdoc of mine in France. It's very important to know what cost function you're using. Tapio gave an example that you must use certain kinds of statistics and not simple values to, in your cost function. If you have many metrics that you want to all, all minimize all of them, then you have to decide how you normalize them against each other or weight them against each other. You may not want to, there's there ways to get around this weighting problem, but in theory, you can ask this as a question around the purpose of the model. What is it for? Different people want the model to do different things and they might give different weights to a certain metric. They might consider something important versus not important. So a, a, a good example, which you can demonstrate by looking at the models in CMIP, some models, uh, for example, the ones in India, take the Indian monsoon very seriously and they give it a lot of weight in deciding whether they have a good model or not. Other centers may not. If you're using observations, you must know whether the observations sample the space sufficiently. Similarly, if you're using Chinese ladder, if you're using models higher on the ladder for calibration, are they sampling all possible states and what are the associated uncertainties? You need to know that. And there are feedbacks on multiple time scales that are compensating errors. In the, some of these new techniques that are coming up for calibration, you can at least diagnose some of these things. So, but it's a useful way to think about this problem. You can you can do this more now. Now, I think in the machine learning era, you can do this more formally than we were doing in the past. For example, this pro project I was involved in in France is called High Tune, which stands for tuning towards high resolution models. Uh, the formalism is not that important. I'm not going to walk through the details, but basically you compute the second equation is something called the implausibility function. So lambdas are the parameters you can tune in the model. And the implausibility says how far the distance for a given uh, metric that you're using, how far are they from your, your observations or whatever your state you're tuning towards. And so that's a Euclidean distance that you normalize by a certain error quantity. And you try to keep the implausibility less than some threshold, usually T, it's measured in standard deviations. So three standard deviations is a kind of statistical uh, rule of thumb for what makes something likely or not likely. And the space that's left is called NROI, not ruled out yet. So this is not, if you notice, it's not doing an optimization, it is doing elimination. It is eliminating areas of parameter space that do not correspond to the data that you're working towards. And you can apply, instead of applying a weight function, you can use different metrics in different waves. That is, you can do an, a one, one, for one metric, you, you count your implausibility, you're left with a certain parameter uncertainty space. And then within that, you search again using a different metric and you do that sequentially until you get to an NROI space that is uh, small enough that you can actually run the forward model using it. So it's only a few parameters to search. One thing you notice is that the NROI space might actually turn out to be a null space, which means for your given formulation of equations, uh, there's, there's no setting of parameters that could correspond to the data you're working towards. That means you have structural error in your model and you need to rethink your parameterizations. A you similar approach to the one that, um, that uh, I'm, I'm sorry? Two minutes left. Okay. All right, I'll try to hurry then. So the, the Klima is using an approach that I won't talk about very much. This is an important problem I, I want to make. So the, many people are using now machine learning machine. to work towards reanalysis data sets or constraint, what I'm calling constraint models. Uh, we can talk about this later if you like, but the, basically the what this paper is showing is quite an important result, which is showing that the Hadley cell circulation appears in a lot of climate models from the CMIP-5 era to be declining with time. A lot of reanalysis models, which are the ones shown in green, show the opposite signal for a couple of decades. And what the paper concludes is that this is actually arising from the fact that um, uh, the reanalysis models do not necessarily conserve certain quantities correctly. 
And this might be an error that is actually present in the reanalysis, but not present in the models, which actually try to conserve certain quantities. So it may be that the so-called models are right and the so-called observations are wrong. The other use of emulators I want to talk about is for sampling the counterfactuals. You want to know, for example, um, um, whether you should, for a decarbonization strategy, whether you focus only on CO2 or do you focus on methane, you focus on methane, CO2, and N2O, and so forth. So which targets are important? All of these are done by um, looking at single forcing runs, which are, again, counterfactual. They cannot be done in reality. And there are too many forcings to, uh, to, to consider. So this is never done with models. This has all been done with emulators, which have been built as fits to models. This has been alluded to in an earlier paper, in an earlier presentation as well. For example, here you're looking at the emulators used in uh, AR6 to reduce the CMIP6 spread. So because we have the so-called hot model problem where there's a lot of models showing very high climate sensitivity and the IPCC wanted to show a bound of likely uncertainty. So they actually used various techniques um, based on regressing towards the, the latter half of the 20th century to constrain this range of uncertainties. Digital twins was also earlier mentioned. This is just an, uh, using the Google n-grams. I measured the number of times digital twins have been referred to. There was a brief spurt of it uh, back in around 2003 when they were applied to uh, uh, engineered systems. Recently, there's been an explosion in the use of the word. Uh, but when you're saying you're building a twin of something that's chaotic and is not even well understood, I think you're really committing overreach, as I've argued in a recent paper. Uh, this is another version of the Hawkins and Sutton pro, uh, paper that's written by a former intern of mine, uh, Mackenzie Blanusa. So she wrote a version of this. Lena was also referred to in the previous two talks. You can see that the role of internal, this is for local, instead of doing for, for a global measure, you're looking at the different uh, contribution of uncertainty at local scale in Seattle, Montreal, and Lagos. And depending on where you are, it turns out that model uncertainty may be important or internal variability might dominate. So there are limits to predictability at local scales that we need to keep in mind. Let me go to my final slide. I want to argue that decision-making for climate as opposed to weather requires traceable model hierarchies. So you need to be able to run both high resolution and low resolution models because one alone will not give you the answers you want. You need counterfactuals as much or even more than predictions. Climate is not weather, so there are going to be um, model-free methods taking over in weather. I, I think that's entirely appropriate, but the same models may or may not work for climate, so I need to take that into account. Uh, some people are arguing that uh, you can do everything directly from data and you don't need models anymore. There was a, an article in The Guardian, for example, titled, Are We Witnessing the Dawn of Post-Theory Science? We can argue about that. Exercise caution when using reanalysis for training, the paper I showed. Uh, computers are getting bigger than faster than there's a uh, then yeah, I've said that before. There is always a loss function. You all heard the phrase, all models are wrong, some are useful, but I also want to point out all models are calibrated. What we can do now, I think what the machine learning era brings is that you can use calibration and do it very quickly. You can do fast sampling of uncertainty using emulators. We need to be very transparent about uncertainty and tuning. I think that's a, re a reporting requirement in order for our models to be useful downstream by other models. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Balaji. Any questions? Everybody's taking notes. Maybe maybe I'll start. Um, so I, I wasn't familiar with the, the Charney ladder idea, but given what you've just said, um, in talking about starting at sort of the top of the ladder and walking down it now, at least if I, if I interpreted this correctly, sort of implies we have a top of the ladder to start from. You mentioned LES as one possible way of starting there and for example, training on that and moving down the ladder. Does that imply that this, I mean, seems to me that means this approach only works for certain subsets of problems where maybe we already have the capabilities at high resolution, we just maybe can't do enough of them or run them for long enough. Is that true? And if so, what are those subsets of problems where you think this is most effective? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. So I think Tapio pointed this out at all. I mean, if anything that requires, for example, uh, condensed water where you depend on microphysics, that's all happening at micron scales or smaller. So you're never going to get to direct simulations of those. You can simulate turbulence. So you can do even, you can go even beyond LES and do what I call direct uh, numerical simulations where you don't even use a turbulence closure. 
So you can the, you can treat that whole hierarchy of model. Yes, and I do argue the, the title of the paper is in fact climbing down Chinese ladder to saying that we must go the uh, the and the upper limit might just come from the fact that computing has hit a limit and we need to stop somewhere because that's where we are because there are some computing constraints. But I believe we can learn a lot from idealized models. We do not need to run very high resolution over the globe using present day conditions using the present day distribution of continents and all that. I don't think. And my, my, my argument is that you don't need that because you actually want to learn uh, universal physics that will generalize well to the future. So I think you can do that very well using idealized models at very high resolution. I think you can learn the physics from that is my argument. Thank you. Okay, John, go for it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by um, weather forecasting being done in a model-free method. Could you help me understand that? Okay, so what these um, some of these papers I've referenced here, Pangu Weather, Graphcast, and all are doing, uh, they take the um, uh, they take ERA five reanalysis, and they learn to uh, emulate them more or less exactly. They they do an ex extremely good job of emulating those, and they can use those to but focus forward. They, uh, there is no sense in which you understand anything. It's a it's a neural network whose weights are not interpretable. But if your problem is simply, they, they put an asterisk there. I mean, they're not exactly model free, right? I just told you they were trained on ERA5. ERA5 is produced by a model. So the, the, the model was responsible for making sure that the variables that they're training on are physically consistent with each other and respect certain covariances. So there is a model behind it. But even granting that this is a model free, let's assume that it's model free. Uh, in the weather problem, I mean, I would argue that uh, you basically want to know if it's raining or not tomorrow. You want to take an umbrella, you do not want to take an umbrella. You don't care how it's produced. There is no need for counterfactuals. There's no need for understanding in, 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 if you would interpret it strictly. But I think climate, you have to think about this very carefully because climate decision-making is not like simply, do I take an umbrella or do I not? It's, it's a much more complex set of decisions. It's done differently. So treating climate as though it's a kind of extended weather problem, I think can lead us down the garden path. So that's kind of where I'm arguing. There may be a divergence where ML makes huge inroads into weather, but I, those same models when applied for to climate may not do as well. Does that okay. make sense? It does, but I don't agree. I think that you have to understand how weather systems work in order to understand how the climate system works. I think there's no escaping that. But oh, that's I just... agree. For climate, I don't agree. I don't disagree at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, Galen, go for it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I just wanted to carry on from what I think Libby's question was a little bit, uh, which is that, you know, that we have a lot of processes in the system that uh, we can't, we don't know, right? The land carbon sink, the ocean carbon sink, other, other processes. How then, if we uh, focus on just idealized models, uh, how then do we... Uh, move those things forward in terms of understanding like carbon climate feedbacks, right? Uh, do we, we think that, yeah, because we don't even know what resolution we need for those processes either, right? We don't have, we don't have ERA-5 with, we could just train things, right? So how do, how do we integrate the pieces, I guess, is the question. I'm yeah, ask. so I, I'm quite convinced, uh, as you probably are, Galen, that I think the, these are the critical problems which we need to be focusing attention on is, in fact, uh, what, is, what, what is the land sink, what is the ocean sink, and how are they going to change over the next few decades, depending on various scenarios? And we don't have clear answers. We don't have first principles ways of uh, defining the land carbon sink. You will, you will, it will be empirical models of one kind or another. Uh, but I do think um, the latter idea still can apply. I mean, you have to figure out how uh, processes that are happening at one resolution, what is their aggregate at a different resolution, at a different lower resolution. I don't think that's a ill-posed question. I think that's a, that's a well-posed question that has some answer. I don't know what it is, but there is some answer to it. And there are ways of testing we can develop to see if these, these kinds of models, when you do that, which you can think of as, again, emulations of very high resolution Earth system models, whether those emulations, uh, they're not idealized in any sense, I agree with you. There's, it's not like an LES, which is simply computing turbulence over uh, uh, some sort of boundary condition. So it's, it's much more complex than that. But I completely agree with you that these are the big problems. If uh, you know, if, if if you ask me where we should be focusing attention on, I would say it's exactly what you said. What is the, what is the fate of the land and ocean carbon sinks? 
And I don't think high resolution models can tell you that because you'll never be able to run them for long enough to answer anything useful. All right, with that, thank you, Balaji. Um, and with that, we're done with session two and get to move on to session three, which is our panel. Um, and Ruby will take over from here. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Amy and I will be moderating this panel discussion. So first of all, I want to welcome back all of our speakers. Right, so, so we have great speakers. We have heard a lot of very interesting points. Uh, so will all the speakers turn on your video so we can see you? Yeah, so I, I think how we are going to moderate this panel discussion is um, kind of like this. Uh, we already set up three different questions, which we listed over here, and I can elaborate on these questions a little bit. So we are going to ask these questions to our panelists to hear what their thoughts are, since um, we heard from the first three speakers on uh, like uh, from the decision-making perspective. And then we heard from another three speakers from the climate modeling perspective. So each side heard the other side, right? So so, so then we, I think we can have a dialogue about these three questions. And then subsequently, I think we probably might still have some time. And then we will open up for our Basque members to ask other questions. And also we would check Slido to see if there are any other questions for the panelists. Uh, and Amy will moderate that part. So that's how we're going to, to do it. At least let's just give it a try. <laughs> um, okay, so, so let's go to the f uh, three questions that we listed over here. Um, I don't think we need to look at the, maybe it's better to see the face, the faces of the, of the speakers. Is it, yeah, okay. All right. Um, so as we saw, the first question is basically uh, trying to see what are the gaps in uncertainty between what's needed in climate informed decision making and what climate modeling can do. Uh, so so as I said, because we the the speakers heard from each side already. And I would like to dive into this a little bit more into also three sub questions related to this broader question. Uh, we heard a lot about like, oh, we need to know the uncertainty, but we haven't heard too much about like what level of uncertainty is acceptable for decision making. And is it enough to be just quantifying and characterizing uncertainty? Or do we actually need to reduce uncertainty? Uh, and then the third sub question is um, how accurate that kind of characterization of uncertainty needs to be because potentially we can have a false sense of uncertainty thinking, oh, we have already narrowed down the uncertainty. I think uh, Isla gave us a really good example about the tropical Eastern Pacific uh, sea surface temperature warming. Uh, what we know, for example, in CIMI-5 models, about half of the model says that the warming will be in the eastern tropical Pacific. The other half of the model says that the warming will be in the central tropical Pacific. And then all of a sudden, in the CIMI-6 models, almost every single one of the models says that the warming will be over the eastern tropical Pacific. But based on what either suggests, maybe that's actually wrong. Maybe all the models are wrong and we are getting a wrong sense of certainty. So I would like to, we would like to hear from our speakers, like, is there a particular level of uncertainty that would be acceptable? Is it enough simply to characterize and quantify uncertainty or do we need to reduce uncertainty? And then what's acceptable in terms of how accurate that kind of characterization is? So I would like to open up to see if um, who would like to respond to this first question as well as maybe the three sub questions that I just asked. So the panelists can raise hand if they want to answer the questions. I'll give them some time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Jennifer? Yeah, I'm happy to dive in and just get the conversation started. So if we can look at changes on the order of, is it 15%, is it 20%, something, something in that order of magnitude, we're perfectly fine with that information. The sea surface temperature example where all the models give the wrong answer is really problematic because what that does is it undermines the confidence in in the uh, climates in the climate community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> that one. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And I see several other hands up as well. Um, Balaji? Uh, I uh, take your point, Jennifer, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, it's it's a point that was raised by Isla as well, and I I showed a graph uh, that the as you go to smaller and smaller scales, if you go from global to regional to local scale, the role of in, internal variability just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So there is a limit, and uh, we cannot hide that limit. I mean, there is a limit. I, I don't think that should undermine confidence in models. Um, we are acknowledging it. We are saying that there are limits to understanding. There are I mean, not limits to understanding. There's limits to predictability, even though you may understand the system perfectly. So that's where that's where we are. And I think it's uh, what I would argue needs to be done is to report this very carefully, not to pre not to pretend that it doesn't exist. All right, and I, we saw also a hand. Okay, uh, Klaus? Ruby, it's usually ask really good questions. Uh, let me make, try to make two points. One, what is acceptable depends on the decision, decision maker and how you communicate it. It's a trite observation, but it's clear. But secondly, maybe we're not the right panel to do so because you know if I want to have a car gearbox fixed, I don't want to talk to a carpenter who knows woodwork. How do you communicate information is typically studied by psychologists and decision analysts. We have someone who does decision analysis here, but uh, this is a problem where, you know, as smart as physicists are, climate scientists are, sometimes you need training in another discipline to avoid putting your foot in your mouth. Um, so having said this, let me just make one more observation. Um, how to communicate uncertainty is context dependent. And there is also something is too little uncertainty because if people see there's overconfidence, it doesn't pass the laugh test and people don't engage. And then people just pick a number and say, oh, they're all crazy to start with. Why don't we just use one? And I think that also has bad outcomes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, Rob? Um I'm gonna, I suppose, push back a little bit, at least on the way you phrase the question um, in, in, in two ways. I mean, and so, uh, I mean, it, clearly um, the scientific community should try to reduce uncertainty because that's what, um, you know, scientists do. I mean, that's what science is, is based on. And so that ought to be going on. Um, from, from my perspective, there was a couple of interesting things missing from this conversation um, and, and one is the sort of when do we know things. So there was, for instance, there was a lot of discussion about internal variability and how big it is. But how, I mean, questions like how long do I need to, how far away from a particular realized state do I need to be before I can differentiate that state from others, some other state? There's some really interesting work going on in, in, in the California water world where people are trying to understand what sorts of patterns you see in the Western Pacific, you know, a couple of months out, determine how you run your reservoirs now, right? And so, I mean, yes, there's a lot of internal variability, but there are signals at various time scales, in that case, months, but maybe years, that can tell us things. And so if if I don't know what the, the end state is, but I know when I'm going to know the end state, um, I can design a strategy around that. And so there was no discussion of that at all. So that that's a whole other dimension that you might look at. And then while the climate science community is reducing uncertainty, there's a whole question of how do you take the information that's currently available and make it available, usable by decision makers. So as part of the communication problem, I showed the example of an expert elicitation where you just get the people. And so, I mean, all the discussion was on climate models, which is in part what we're discussing today, but how do you get the information in the models and the modeling community into the hand of decision makers in a way that is useful now, um, you know, so that they can do it. And again, like the expert elicitation is one way, but there's other ways. Tapio talked a little bit about, you know, uh, APIs and databases, which is important, but how do you transfer what you know now so people can act on it 
And then how do you think about when we know, when we might know more and how that process unfolds so people can think about adaptive strategies that, you know, know where the bifurcations are. Great, thank you very much. Are there any others who might want to address this question? I was particularly um, thinking about this problem of like forced sense of certainty, <laughs> perhaps. Okay, so I see Isla and then uh, Tapio. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to come back to this. Uh, someone made a comment about the uh, specific example undermining the credibility of the climate science. And I certainly hope that would not be what that does. I mean, I, I think we need to accept that all models are wrong and we don't have everything represented correctly. And we're in climate change right now. And we're it's only now that we can start to really see these things and become aware of these problems. And I guess what we need to do is communicate that to people that are making decisions and say, okay, here's what we don't know, but there's a chance that this could be going this way. How would this change how you would deal with climate change if, if in reality, there's you know a 90% chance that the Southwest is going to become even drier than it is now, whereas models say on average zero change. How how differently would you kind of make your decisions? And then it seems like there needs to be some two way interaction that would allow the climate modelers to then know, okay, this is what we really need to know and nail down this problem because people would make very different decisions if this were the case. Um, so yeah, more communication along those lines, I guess. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Tapio? Yeah, I think I want to build on what Isla and Rob said, both of whom I agree with. Um, so with Rob, I want to separate the problem of having climate model output with quantified uncertainties to how you actually use it in decision-making, that decision-making we've heard a lot about. Um, so the Pacific example that, that Isla mentioned, I think is actually a good one, right? If you build a model that is designed to learn from data and is using mismatches between what's simulated and what's observed to quantify errors or improve the model, you need models for both. Well, that's actually great, right? Then you have an example that allows you to improve your either calibration or uncertainty quantification, ideally both. Um, so it's it's not undermining anything. I mean, it's just how science is supposed to work. And we just need to formalize using discrepancies and such data much better than we have. That's the first point. Um, regarding, I think one important communication point is, it often comes up in a climate discussion, but what Balaji said, that internal variability is irreducible. Well, yes, it is. But I think it's kind of asking the wrong questions. I think Jennifer, without trying to put words in your mouth, but let me try to put words, words in your mouth. I think what you care about is, is knowing what is the probability that a flood exceeds a certain threshold, you know, the level of the first floor in the street or whatever it might be, right? And you want to know that probability already now, and already now we don't have good information on that. Um, it's mostly based on historical data, which already now are not adequate for guiding that information. And then we also want to know this in the future. So it becomes a question of probabilities of, say, exceeding thresholds. And already now, that's in part, of course, that's driven by internal variability that controls that, that probability in the end. So it's not it's not a nuisance. It's not an uncertainty in that sense, but it's just something that controls the probability that already for the present day, we need to know. And engineers wouldn't treat this as an uncertainty factor, as I think Jennifer pointed out, but as, as a risk that you plan for. And so it is in the future that might shift by the mean shifting or might shift by the by the, the variance changing and the like. And you can, you can take all of that into account. But I think it's important to reframe this discussion a bit um, in that direction, because I think that's the direction that, ma that matters for for planning. And then the, the fundamental point for all of that, I think, is you need to quantify all uncertainties. We are not currently doing this. So the work that Naila showed and Clara Dessa and others at NCAR started with, with more rigorously quantifying initial condition uncertainty is one important step. But that's the only uncertainty that in any rigorous way we're currently quantifying. We are not quantifying any form of model uncertainty in a rigorous way, neither parametric nor, nor structural. And I think that's the crucial piece that we need to take on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tapio. Uh, anyone else wanted to get back another round of answering these questions after hearing some of these answers? Uh, uh, okay, Bilaji. 
Yeah, can I just make a quick response yeah. to what Tapia yeah. said? So uh, in a, the IPSL has recently published a paper where they are trying to quantify parametric uncertainty the, to the extent where they're saying there are a number of parameter choices which are all equally consistent with data and we don't have a preference between these. How useful it is, I don't know, because unless you publish that entire ensemble, other people cannot use it. But I think uh, honesty is the first step. I think you have to tell people that this is the limit of what we know is the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. All right, Jennifer? Right. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate the conversation around this and, and listening to what I was saying. And I would agree with most of what the speakers are saying. And a lot, of, a lot of this is communication. And so the message that's being received by some of the stakeholder communities is a very, it's a number without a whole lot of additional information about, about the uncertainty and how to use that information. And so I think both the sectors that are trying to use the information, if they're not used to quantifying uncertainty and really dealing with risk-based frameworks, need to be moving in those general directions. At the same time, the communications need to be stronger between the, between the climate science community as well as the sectors to make certain that the information that's being communicated here is also being, uh, being taken into account when we when we look at the models because it isn't historical data it's it's a model great thank you very much jennifer any others okay so let's move to the second question <laughs> so our second question is what so we have heard about these gaps right so um, and and so then the second question is what are the key factors driving the gaps that we have heard right from the decision making perspective like we need certain uncertain um we need uncertainty information but oftentimes uncertainty information may not be available and then we also heard from the climate modeling side like the decision makers need certain information but in climate modeling is really difficult for us to provide some of those information. So, so this question is really open-ended, but I would like perhaps each of the speaker to just pick the two top factors that you think are driving the gaps, because there can be many, right? I, I just want, want you guys to think about like, if you were to pick the top two factors that you think are driving the gaps between the uncertainty that we need to help with decision-making, and the uncertainty information that can be provided by climate modeling. I'll give you some time to think about it. <laughs> but anyone who is ready, please raise your hand. Or, or feel free to kind of change my question a bit if, if it is not something that you... <laughs> yeah, please. Uh -huh. It might be a spillover from the last discussion and forgive my ignorance, but can changes in internal variability be related to the slow climate creep? Is that another source of, um, I guess, uncertainty? How much will the variability change as the climate changes? And it, it, I don't know if anybody works on that because that's where I'm ignorant. But I, yeah. yeah, I wonder yeah. if that's another issue. Is that really? Yeah, I, I think we can definitely hear from some of our speakers. Uh, definitely, it's a big question why we have been mainly focusing our effort on trying to even understand or quantify the internal variability uncertainty, let alone to understand how internal variability might be changing because of climate change. Yeah, but let's hear. Okay, so I. I see two hands up for now. So Isla. Um, yeah, I've forgotten what I was going to say now because I was thinking about changes in internal variability. But yeah, definitely it, that's a topic that people are looking at, right? People are looking at changes in ENSO variance, for example, and the large ensembles allow us to do that. Um, I think I, what I was going to say about the gaps seems to just be a matter of communication. Somehow I, I, I feel like it's hard for people outside of a climate modeling community to really just grasp the nature of internal variability. I mean, an example that we saw in our lab the other day was like Google Earth Engine put up a climate projection for one member of CCSM4 that showed cooling over the US. And then you know, people would just take that on as being the climate change signal when it's not at all. And somehow, I don't know, this is not being absorbed by everyone that needs to absorb it. So I think we need to do something better to communicate it. And then also in terms of what models are fit for looking at, you know, if the, there's definitely things that our global models don't get right. And 
users may not necessarily know that it's just not the right thing to look at for their particular problem. So I, I think a lot more, a lot could be done by just more communication, but obviously everyone's a bit stretched. And so, yeah, there's just limits to what everyone can do. Great, thank you very much, Isla. Uh, Klaus? Also great points to be raised. Um, let me raise another one, which I think is maybe pretty obvious and tried. It's education. Um, for, to do this well, one needs to understand the earth system and climate system, decision making and statistics, to so just name a few examples. There are many more examples that I would be exclusive here. Typically, people are not trained to work across those three fields and many more. Uh, and even today, we saw evidence where people ask questions and it was at the edge of the comfort range of people. And so the question is, how do we actually uh, tackle this challenge that we need to have people who have expertise to go in deep, but also be able to connect and communicate well? Um, and this is to some extent, not just in the produce side information, but also in the user side information. You know, so again, I don't want to put words in Jennifer's mouth, but look, it's just, uh, I'm an engineer myself. Uh, I can speak for myself. When we educate engineers or people who go out of the world with an undergrad degree, um, the amount of knowledge they have about uncertainty and climate adaptation is sometimes, uh, well, there's room for growth, let's put it this way. Uh, and if you want to have an informed populace that actually can use it and to really use the information we have, we need to make sure uh, that we have given them at least a chance of the appropriate training. And I think right now there is uh, room for growth. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, Tapio? Uh, for your questions of gaps, I think there are two critical gaps. And so the number one is the connection from data to models, as I mentioned. I think the key area for improving models, reducing quantifying uncertainties is exploiting data, as I mentioned, I think, as Balaji also um, emphasized. Um, and the second key gap is from models to information people actually can and want to use. And we tend to focus on the communication aspect. And I think that's hugely important. Rob mentioned boundary organizations. I think that's hugely important. But we haven't even tried to see how far you can go with improved technology. And I think the key thing here missing is, A, an easy way to traverse climate simulation output and this plethora of Earth's observations we have. Right now, if you want to look at Earth observations, it's sort of typically one grad student per data set. You know, the data handling is complicated. It's all sorts of different formats. And what especially machine learning tools give you is adding value to data by exploiting correlations that may not be obvious. And we cannot right now do this. We cannot harness the potential of AI in an effective way for climate adaptation, for providing information to users because Climate simulations are in one place. Who knows where they'll go once we have higher resolution simulations. Data are in all sorts of other places. And it becomes really hard to jointly exploit simulations and data. I think the first step there should be you know, the platformization of climate data, the observational data simulation output. And on top of that, you can build a whole range of tools for easily communicating flood risks, fire risks, hurricane risk, whatever it might be, to users and give, give users, consumers, businesses, tools in their hands that, that are a joy to play with and explore. And then we can ask the communication again, question again, well, what else is missing that people actually use it in a decision making? But you know, everyone is used to using weather apps. We have no climate apps that allow you to explore climate outcomes in any meaningful way. And I think we should build them. That's a very interesting idea. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Jennifer. So I really like that idea. And one of the things when I was listening to the talks this morning was I heard about national data sets for pretty much every agency. And yet for our stakeholder communities, we don't have those sort of toolboxes that we can play with that are uh, available to us that have information, a lot of different forms. Um, 
NOAA has tried to pull some of those together, but they're really very ad hoc. And so being able to have that sand pit where we can engage, we can play with the data, we can understand where there's areas that are, have high uncertainties versus where areas we, where we have a fair amount of confidence would be absolutely lovely, as well as areas where we can't ever give a stakeholder information about what's going to happen every three seconds or at the, at the, finer, at the finer scales. Um, so I think that would, that would really move the field forward if we had that ability to be able to look nationally at some of these, some of these challenges. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. Any other response to this question about the gaps and the factors driving the gaps? Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, Rob, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this echoes a lot of what's been said, but we do it sort of from a different vantage is, um, I mean, a lot of this conversation and, and particularly, let me just build on what, what Jennifer talked about, you know, if you've got engineers, they've got, you know, many, many decades of professional practice, which has been using stationary climate data. And we're trying to figure out how to take information about a different system and kind of match it to those processes. And so I think there, one of the gaps is sort of this, you know, co-production, co-design between the climate science community and all these individual communities of practice to figure out, you know, what is sort of the minimum changes that they need to make in what they do to use the information that climate scientists can produce. And so it, it does go beyond communication, which sort of has this, you know, um, you know, sort of weather feel to it, right? You know, well, people have always been trying to decide whether to bring an umbrella or not, they're going to provide the better information so they can do that, is that people are going to be making, have, following carefully constructed practice or, or constructed practices that you need to do for legal and, and, you know, all safety, all sorts of reasons, and figuring out how to redo them with this new type of information, which is new in part because it comes from models, new because it comes, it has a different character of uncertainty to it and, and so forth. And, you know, when you actually do this sort of thing, I mean, you can get very big uh, changes in, in this sort of information and the way, the, the way people use information, the design of, of systems and so forth. I mean, just, just a very, um, you know, uh, an example that, that we just went through and we were doing warning systems, went in with one, with a small town, um, went in with one conception. We all had it on all sides of what, what it would look like. But once you got into what the data actually looked like, what you could get out of the sensors and what people were comfortable with in terms of signal to noise and who was making decisions, the whole thing got redesigned. So it went from like a siren notion that we're going to warn the whole community to an individualized um, app-based system where people would get information customized to them and then they would decide what to do. So, I mean, it's just like the whole, when you match the information available with the decision space, you got like a whole different thing. So I think there's a whole area of there to work between the climate community and these different decision communities. All right, thank you very much, Rob. And uh, we have Bellagi and then Jennifer again, yeah. So this is uh, uh, more of a question than an answer to anything, I think. But I, I, we, there's a presumption I'm hearing in this entire discussion that we are using this word information, but we seem to be seeking numbers. Does information have to be quantitative to be useful? So this is a question because I have a feeling that in that case, uh, we might be disappointed, but we might be able to give qualitative answers to certain questions that are useful. There are some questions for which I don't even know the answer. I mean, I don't know, for example, if uh, planting a lot of trees is, is even the right sign of an answer in terms of a mitigation signal. So this is a question for anybody who wants to take it up. Does, when we're talking about this, does everything have to be quantitative to be useful? Yeah, I think this is a great question, Balaji, because oftentimes as scientists, we like to explain certain things. We may not necessarily give a precise number, but we like to be able to explain like, oh, why should we be expecting uh, there would be more moisture in the air or, or why extreme precipitation might be increasing, but not necessarily 
precise in terms of the number, but would that kind of information and explanation be be useful, right? So I don't know whether anyone would like to. Uh, Jennifer, um, I'll, I'll answer the okay. question. All right. Um, from my perspective, uh, sometimes just the direction is really helpful. It's going to get higher. It's going to get lower. Um, <laughs> at least that gives us a fighting chance, or we have no idea. Um, that's that's information. Um, I did want to sign off. Um, so I'm going to let people put words in my mouth after I leave. I have to go catch a flight. Uh, but I want to thank the BAS coordinators for a really lovely, lovely session and for, for inviting me uh, to come and, and participate. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, Effie and then, um, yeah, Effie, uh -huh, please. And Jennifer, before you leave, <laughs> there is a study that both me and Ruby uh, are part of, an NRC study on modernizing the probable maximum precipitation that you are very aware of. Uh, and of course, under climate change, non, non stationarity, for those that don't know, probable maximum precipitation was defined as the theoretically upper limit of precipitation that is ever possible to fall over an area, over a duration at a given time of the year. And this is what how we design high risk dams or nuclear power plants. Of course, you have to change the process by which we, uh, we define this PMP. Now, what I wanted to say is here in the US, there will be a lots of studies uh, to come up with revised PMPs and the national standard for producing them. But I was impressed to see that in Switzerland, they have already done some analysis and the, uh, Switzerland has been basically classified in regions of 1.2, 1.4, meaning the factor that you amplify the PMP to design your dam or to upgrade your older facility is not you know, endless. Um, research. There is, for the engineers, there is a product. You are in the region of 1.4 PMP, uh, so on. So there is there are the two extremes where you need an answer as an engineer, as you said, you, you just need to build something. Uh, and all the uncertainty that uh, we try to nail down because we are, you know, the scientists and the engineers. And it's interesting to see the two different paths. I just wanted to bring that example. That's great. Thank you very much, Effie. And thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. All right. Um, I see Bob has his hand up. Sure. Thanks. So I want to ask the question. I sort of got at in the chat a little bit uh, during the, the first half. Um, but the question of, as we think of users, I feel like even when we're talking about this from a decision-centered approach, we're still thinking about a decision that is ultimately owned by an agency or somebody who is responsible for carrying it out. But in fact, in many of the decisions we're talking about, these are things that played out over decades with a whole bunch of stakeholders involved. And it's not just we want all their values represented, but we have to think about if we're coming up with a plan or some use of the data, what's the duration? Like, what what is the ability, what is our ability to actually implement a plan given all the factors that are exogenous to what we're doing um, that could affect the results? Like, how do we make sure our, what we're doing is actually useful given, uh, you know, there's a lot of political economy, for instance, that goes on between, uh, you know, modeling flood hazard and looking at idealized adaptation pathways and actually implementing adaptation pathways. Um, how, how do we How do we think about that and make sure we're still not like when we think about the realities of decision making, we're still not operating in like a super high, hyper idealized decision maker world and end up going down a path that is costly and involves a lot of very high fidelity modeling when the noise of political economy is going to interrupt any connection between that high fidelity modeling and decision making once you get it a year or two down the road. All right. So anyone would like to respond or make a comment related to Bob's uh, comment or question? Yeah. Okay. No, All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, with that, I think it's really important for us to get to the third question here. So, but we can always uh, come back with some of these previous questions and comments as well. So the last question that we set up, because we heard a lot about gaps 
And so it's important for us to talk about opportunities, right? So what are the opportunities to close the gaps? For example, we heard a lot from uh, Rob and also Klaus about like maybe flipping the 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 way we think about things, uh, not necessarily from climate modeling to decision, but also from decision uh, to climate modeling and the learning, the, the iteration, not only like one one way and the other way, but but this kind of learning, I think learning has been emphasized a lot. How do we facilitate that? Um, then we also heard about some of these like newer tools, right? AI machine learning, high resolution modeling, are these tools providing opportunities for us to perhaps uh, close the gaps of the gaps <laughs> um, in terms of opportunities? And and any other um, uh, um, comments that you might have related to, yeah, opportunities for closing the, the gaps? So again, I'll, I'll give you guys a bit of time. <laughs> so any, anyone who's ready, let me know. I'll, I'll, I suppose I'll okay. dive in. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I very much tend to go to you know sort of process answers for questions like that because I think you know these specific answers are 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 very context dependent. But um, I mean, the opportunity is um, it, it's starting to get pretty hard to find, you know, any organization across the country that uh, does not think uh, they need to think about, uh, you know, changing climate and its impacts on them. So there are, you know, and there's actually money towards it. And so there's lots of opportunity for interaction among climate scientists and people making decisions. Um, and, um, you know, as we've had some discussion, um, both, you know, in verbally and in, in some of the, the, the chat, I mean, there's, you know, lots of opportunities to start doing test cases of what information is, is most useful, both quantitative and qualitative, what, um, um, uh, you know, what, what do decision makers need in particular contexts? Um, and then, I mean, I, I think it's all, you know, it, and that's both true for examples, and then it also helps do this generalization. You know, so much of what people do is heuristic-based because it's worked a whole bunch of times in the past, so that's just what you do. Um, and so develop new heuristics um, so that most of these decisions can be pretty quick. The, the example I think Effie gave of, you know, Switzerland went through and gives like a factor, you know, like the, you know, so sunset gardening map, right? There's 12 regions and you look up the region and you know what to plant, right? And it's, uh, so they did that for the maximum precipitation. Um, you know, so for, for many, you'd like to, for as many decisions as possible to be like really easy. You just do this and, uh, you know, there's a different heuristic and then you need a way to, you know, kick it out to where, you know, which, um, what, when you really need to think hard. And so Jennifer showed the tier one tier, to tier three, and presumably if you're doing a tier three, you spend a lot more on uh, you know downloading climate data than you do on a tier one. Um, and you know again, it's that sort of screening tool. But how do you do the screening? How do you do a quick climate screening for most decisions? Not which ones you need to do um, a, a lot more work on, and just doing cases and developing those heuristics. I, I you know is I think where we need to go, and there's lots of opportunities for engaging with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Rob. Klaus? I need to be a pattern here that I follow up, Rob. Uh, Rob, this is a great point, as usual. And you made the point that there is more demand. But I do also think that we're in a situation where the supply is limiting and becoming more and more so. So let me just ask a question for everybody that reached out to you and says, uh, Rob, can you please help us? How many people do you have to turn down? Uh, and they would actually be benefiting from more information. And is it really, do we, um, do we educate the appropriate number of people with the appropriate skills to engage in this kind of work that is needed, that people are asking for? Am I supposed to answer that or people? Uh, you can answer it. Yes. 
Um, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I actually don't have a good answer to that. And that may be another, you know, question. I mean, looking at the skills gap and skills pipeline might be a really interesting, uh, set of, set of questions. Um, um, you know, we get lots of inquiries, um, uh, you know, AGU has got its thriving earth exchange where they send people out to work on things, which I think gets, you know, lots, uh, probably engages about as many people as they, they have to engage. So, um, but the actually looking at the skills map and skills pipeline, um, what what can you do? Um, you know, what level of training do you have to do this? But yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Um, Papio? I think I want to in part answer Klaus's questions. Um, yeah, the, the HR question, basically. Um, I forget who said it, it was Klaus or Rob, um, uh, saying that you know the number of people producing climate models are far smaller than the number of people wanting to use it. There's a huge opportunity here. There's a market now for climate information. People estimate this to be $40 billion a year or so. As Rob said, you know, climate information affects just about every longer term decision. And and we know that climate models have problems. We know that we are not adequately communicating the information. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity. We are working in an area where we deal with data, we deal with computing, in an area that matters to people. It is what early career scientists, the best scientists of the young generation now want to do, scientists, engineers, and the like. And we need to offer them on ramps. To, to work in this area. We need to grow the workforce. And I think that's essential. A challenge with that is that a lot of climate modeling or a lot of what we are talking about also making the, the information useful is happening at large centers, which are not the easiest on-ramp for students to get involved in this area. So I think one, one corollary to me is that universities need to get much more involved. Climate modeling is not something that has happened at universities in the last few decades. It started there, but it migrated out of it. This more applied work um, that we are talking about here is likewise very sparsely represented at best at universities, say hazard, hazard modeling. It's, it's mostly focused in the private sector. As a result, it's pretty closed off. A lot more of that could happen in the open at universities where I guarantee you, from what I see of our students, they gravitate towards this kind of work. It's interesting science engineering problems that matter. So we need to offer them on ramps. There need to be funding avenues to fund this research at universities or wherever the next generation can, can find a way in. And I think we need to capitalize on this, on this opportunity more than we're currently doing. Um, that's number one. Again, the other opportunity to me is, is in, in exploiting data more broadly across the board and maybe in part an answer to Rob's important question. You know, as it is, we are talking as if there is some sort of grand decision maker that makes the decisions and that's maybe not the best mental model for, for thinking about it. And we'll have to revise these mental models. But again, I would say we also need to revise the tools. Um, you know, everyone uses weather forecasts for decision making every day. A lot of businesses do, obviously, and a lot of consumers do. And there isn't isn't a question about the weather forecasting decision maker anymore because the tools are universally accessible and useful. And I think we need to get closer to a state where where we have tools that are universally accessible and useful. And Bob in the chat said there is a bunch of tools. You know, the White House has a portal for the CMAP archive, and that's all good. But I think it's not what I'm talking about. I want I want tools that are a joy to use, easy to use, and and say for an engineer, they're so easy that you know, climate is only one of many factors to consider in an engineering decision. So you need to meet people where they are with very easy to use tools and sending them to a White House portal where you sift through things or, or any other of the portals we have is not gonna do it. And likewise, that's I think the other big opportunity I see. Thank you very much, Tapio, very well said. <laughs> okay, um, okay, so we have Mary. Ruby, you also have Linda, who wants who oh, can't get her oh, hand up, but she wants oh, to ask I'm a sorry. question. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Let's go. Um, who is first? 
<laughs> I, I like think Linda. Comment on Papio's just okay. Point. So 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 let's go with Mary first, since she's going to comment. On well, I, I was going. Yeah, I want to make a comment and then do a question. And so let me at least make my comment now. Um, so Tapio, I. I I, I stopped myself from cheering as you were talking, um, because I think you articulated well, I think what a lot of us have been seeing here. And so I wanted to let the panel know that, you know, the board is very focused on climate services. And we actually have a closed session tomorrow to talk about some, you know, potential steps forward there. But I think we do have to entrain all of the sectors, um, you know, and it's almost sectors in every sense of the word, <laughs> you know, um, that people that are working in engineering firms today need to be versed in this. So I think, um, you know, health, the same thing will need to happen here. But I think there's some national efforts that are needed. Um, to bridge between the the public sector, the private sector, the philanthropic sector, and the government sector. And we're not at all moving in that regard. And that's been really a focus, a focus of the board. Um, I'll put my other question out there now, but you might not want to take it. Before we're done with this, uh, uh, the session, I would love to hear from each of the panelists. Your, your talks were just great. If you see something or is there an area you think Basque or the broader academies could be helpful here, we'd love to we'd love to hear that from you. Yeah, definitely. That would be an important question that we would end with. Um, OK, so Linda. Yeah. Thanks, Ruby. So um, I just wanted to this is. I think a question that's related to everything we've been discussing, it's it's not clear to me. Can someone I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Jennifer left. Um, but one of the panelists described a situation where they've worked with stakeholders and the reaction was, oh, well, there's just too much uncertainty. We cannot make a decision. Because that, you know, I mean, it's really not clear to me to what degree the uncertainty that exists now is a problem for decision making. Yeah, that goes back to the very first question that we discussed. Uh -huh. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Any, any, anyone wants to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Rob, yes, Rob. Rob definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, people need to make decisions, and obviously, not even you know, not doing anything is a decision. People make decisions. Um, and if there's too much uncertainty, I think the tendency more is just to ignore that whole factor and often pretend it's zero. Um, what, do you and, ignore, what do you mean ignore that whole factor? So no climate change. I think that's it, what it, it, Yeah, I mean, if like climate is too uncertain, you just ignore it um, mm -hmm. and yeah. pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and make your decision without that. So in other words, you make your decision, but it's what evidence do you admit into, uh, you know, bring into the decision making process? Hmm. But are you saying that you actually have experienced that since I know you have worked with many stakeholders where there were situations where the stakeholders just threw up their hands and said, too much uncertainty, we're going to ignore climate. Well, I think that was the case for a very long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and, 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 and the FEC is currently arguing about that very thing, right? So yes, yeah. there are certainly examples. <laughs> well, I, I would say that there are also counter example, like California State. You know, California is one place where we know the projections for the precipitation change has always been like, oh, it's either positive or it's either negative. <laughs> but still, the state continues to <laughs> yeah, yeah. Buy and ask for information. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So let's move to uh, Bob and then uh, Balaji. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think this is actually where um, you wanted to, to end the panel on, but I'll ask a question. We can delay it if you're not, which is basically, you know, I've been trying to listen with themes of, okay, is there something where the academies weighing in could make a difference? And I think the thing that's emerged particularly in the last 10 minutes on this focus on training and workforce development for this, this space seems like one such area. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I also heard Tapio saying, well, we don't have public adequate public data infrastructure in this country um, as a, another potential area. But so so apologies if, if Ruby, I am jumping ahead on your panel, but I, but I, what I wanted to ask is, well, basically, where where do you think the academies, right, either on sort of a short term basis with like workshops or recognizing that we're a little, the academies are a little slow often with studies. And so that's like a two year process. Um, you know, where, where, where is there a need for, for external voices to come in and comment to the agencies or otherwise or convene people? Great, yeah. So let's, yeah, let's give a heads up for all the panelists, because our last question for you is, what might you suggest uh, that BASC or the National Academy can do about this? Because we have heard a lot about the gaps in um, uncertainty in decision making, right? So, but before that, let's go to Balaji, and then we'll have every uh, panelist give us some suggestions for where the National Academy or the BASC might work on. In, in this space, um, Balaji, yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, I had two remarks to make, maybe I'll make just one, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, well, let's see. But the, the remark I wanted to make is that this discussion seems to have been, I don't know whether by intention or just by accident, almost entirely focused on climate adaptation. I've heard almost no talk about climate mitigation. And I believe your initial question for the third question, Ruby, was about opportunities. Uh, I do believe there are a lot of opportunities in the mitigation space to improve in particular uh, carbon cycle modeling and other aspects of the climate system, which um, perhaps are getting insufficient attention. So I think that that's an opportunity area that you could look at, and maybe that's a comment for Basque as well. So I think, uh, yes, we should be thinking about adaptation, but let's not uh, forget mitigation. And there's a lot of deep scientific problems like, you know, Galen, Galen mentioned in one of her questions. So what is the size of the land sink and the, and the ocean sink and what is going to happen to them? Uh, either in a, if we don't do anything, or well, more importantly, even if we do do something, if we do get on, a, if the planet gets on a target into a net zero pathway, then what happens to the land and ocean carbon sinks? I think that question is still uh, unknown. So I think that's, a, that's an opportunity that I see. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll just stop there. The second question was a little technical, but I think it's probably too late for that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, but 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 please do. Yeah, let us know if you have that comment uh, by email or anything. Uh-huh. All right. Um. Okay. So we we come to the last question before we wrap up with any other remaining questions, right? So we would love to hear from the panelists, like what your suggestions might be that would be good for the National Academy and the past to take on in this space. Okay, so I see, uh, I, I'm assuming Pop's hand, yeah, okay. Um, all right, Isla, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think bringing together the climate modelers and the decision makers, I mean, back to Linda's question, I guess I don't, I don't really ever interact with stakeholders, but I would very much like to know as an analyzer of climate models where the biggest problems are for decision making, where the uncertainties are that people can't handle, because that should be our focus. So I think, yeah, bringing together the communities and finding ways to improve the communication between them. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Tapio? I think the number one priority to me would be provide some roadmap for organizing climate model output and data jointly. I think this will hit us very soon, and we are not prepared for it. You know, Ruby, you and DOE are producing high-resolution simulations, and many more will be coming. We have all this data. I think this is it's in a way building the interstate highway system. It will just create a whole industry of things you can do with data that right now we can't do. And the resources to do it, computing resources are there in the government within the UAE and the like. The technological resources is a bit more challenging, but provide a roadmap with what needs to be done that at least it gets on people's agenda that we should do something about it. I think this will otherwise come, it'll hit us unprepared. And of course, you know, where the national academies can help is um, 
making recommendations for funding research to the to the agencies and making it clear that the areas we are talking about both on the sort of modeling side and the adaptation side the closer to the stakeholders these are super interesting science and engineering problems that have direct applications i mean, I, I love what i do because it's fundamental science, but it translates immediately into something that can be useful, right? And it's few areas where you have that direct translation. And you know, we are, we, in our field, there's this dichotomy between climate science and climate modeling. They're kind of viewed as different things. They shouldn't be. I mean, Suki Manabe was not a climate modeler. He was an excellent climate scientist who built fantastic climate models. And I think we need to get back to more of that mindset. And I think, Basque and the National Academies can help here in recommending programs that work um, directly on climate modeling. There are some, there are climate process teams, but then even downstream hazard modeling would be another area where I think there's there's great opportunity for um, publicly funded research that, that will make a difference. That That's scientifically engineering, from an engineering point of view, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tapio. Uh, Rob? Um, three things. Um, one is the workforce questions uh, um, that we've been discussing. So three things that the academy might be able to do. Um, an another is, is is evaluation of what's working and what's not in terms of communication information provision. Um, I mean, there's a lot of use cases out there, and and when you're actually doing these things, it's it's actually very hard to get funding to actually do any evaluation. So that would be useful. Um, and then just I'll we tee up again the the sort of the signposts. Um, what might we know when um, as you think about the different pathways that you go mm -hmm. along, which I think is a very useful input to decision making, but often not highlighted in some of these discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, okay, uh, Klaus, I think I saw his hand. Yes, one quick comment. Um, Tapio, you're right. There's one thing which connects what you said to what Rob was showing, you know, the fourth blade in the propeller diagram, the responses and how we go from hazards to risks, which is due to vulnerability and exposure is really crucial. Um, and that also goes to the workforce problem in terms of uh, we need climate science, but earth system science in the broad sense where humans are a key driver, they're impacted, but they're also impacting the earth system. I think that can be rather crucial. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyone else? Um, we pretty much run out of time, but I, I hate to just stop without having <laughs> anyone, <laughs> anyone else who might have questions that you were not able to, to bring up um, from, from Basque or if we have any questions from Slido. Or... There was a, a number, uh, there are a number just to, from, from the public, there are a number of questions around bringing it back to the user needs of how do we reconcile these questions about the, the models at whatever scales we're looking at and the kinds of uh, decisions and data that Jennifer was talking about that are needed and um, just what are the opportunities there. Um, and then also, um, Yeah, there were a couple of them that just came back down to how do you how do we make that how what do we how do we think about that connection between those numbers like what Effie was talking about something that engineers can use directly mm -hmm. and how do we keep as as models iterate uh, connecting back to those specific needs for decision makers who were looking for specific numbers. Mm -hmm. Any further comments on that? Yes, yeah, please. Uh, actually, Amy, please. <laughs> please. I've been the most quiet moderator because you're doing everything, so. <laughs> I don't have anything to add because you've been in calling on everybody except for Linda. <laughs> there you go. So I have a question just because it's out of ignorance. I understand the astronomy field a lot better, I think, than climate change right now. So do you do the equivalent of the astrodecadal? Because I think climate change has reached that point now. I mean, there's some wonderful things that the astronomy community has done. They've seen this 
ball rolling that intense data is going to come in as soon as they launch the LSST, Vera Rubin, multiple things. And they've self-organized and created systems of when we get a million alerts a night, how are we going to broker those and how are we going to quality control those and how are we going to send those out? And they've self-organized. But also in astronomy, every 10 years, they do God's gift to the worst, probably um, assignment close to a thousand white papers. And when it comes out, it ranks for the feds. What are the most important things in this category? Like really large scale instrumentation, medium sized instrumentation and other things. And it gives a priority and we respond to those priorities. And I feel like climate change has grown up enough now that that could be useful. And that could be something that the academies and the Basque could do too. Mm -hmm. That and comms training. I will tell you, we have a postdoc program in astronomy and every one of those postdocs every year gets comms training. Um, this year, it's the Alan Alda School. We have a comms expert that comes in. And I got to tell you, I don't make the same talk that I gave 20 years ago. And no offense, but y'all give really science dense talks that I can't reach my next door neighbor with. So a combination of comms training, probably Amanda, you could speak to that because I know you went through Spitfire, right? Um, those two things might be recommendations. Okay. Can I respond on the decadal question? Yeah. So um, the academies does do a decadal survey of the space space programs. Um, it's jointly funded by NASA and NOAA. It's it's a similar approach to the astronomy decadals, and there are a couple others that our space studies board does. Um, and but we haven't really done like holistically all it, maybe since America's climate choices was probably the most recent version of that. And like we've done, you know, assessments on modeling strategy about. 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, it's a good, it's a good question or it's like individual agencies have asked us to like do assessments of um, like NSF or system science, for example. Yeah. Um, but it's been harder to wrap our hands around, like how might you do that for the whole field? And, and so that, that that's a and, short answer there. Oh, an ocean decadal, Galen, thank you for- Yeah, and, and I mean, and you have IPCC, right? So there's this circling yeah. factor that kind of gets in the way that astronomy doesn't necessarily have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Just a, a quick comment. The Academy did have a program that was called Science and Engineering Ambassadors um, about a decade ago as a pilot. All of the Academy's um, presidents happened to be from within about 40 miles of Pittsburgh. And so we had a we had a program there. I was one of the ambassadors and it was it was a nice program. It didn't it was a lot of work. <laughs> and so it didn't wind up scaling and it doesn't exist anymore. All right, I think we really passed the time. I, I wonder if there are any last comments or last question. If not, I really want to thank um, all the speakers on behalf of the planning committee. Yeah, really, really wonderful talks, lots of great points and lots of suggestions for us to think about. Thank you very much for your time and preparation for, for your presentations and everything. Um, so with that, I pass back the time to Mary. Yeah, well, let's give the panelists a round of applause. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about. Um, so all I'll do is remind um, people that there's a dinner this evening and you should have the details of that in your thing. So I hope to see many of you there. And then you have on your agenda, we'll start tomorrow here, same room, right? Yes. 8.30 a.m. is breakfast. So Nine for the meeting. Nine for the meeting, right. <laughs> I know there's West Coast people. <laughs> They're still in shock. <laughs> okay, so have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.